Warning. This site is for SCP personnel with O5 approval. Access beyond this point for those with standard level 4 security is prohibited and may result in termination of Foundation employment. Unauthorized visitors who survive the memetic kill agent are detained and interrogated under truth-exacting memetic agents. Dr. Herman Wright was used to high security protocols. He had been working with the SCP Foundation for several years and had dealt with specimens both terrifying and valuable. But something about this site was different. The security was tighter than he'd ever seen. And it all seemed a bit too much for what looked like a run-of-the-mill warehouse in Alexandria, Egypt. The street seemed normal. It was surrounded by businesses selling food and clothes, and none of the locals seemed to give a second glance. But as soon as he was approved for access and entered the warehouse, it was a very different story. He looked into the Cognito Hazard testing screen, designed to cause psychic damage to anyone who hadn't been inoculated by the Foundation, and entered the large bunker. Automated guns lined the walls. He could see the outlines of trap doors below him, and he was pretty sure the whole place was rigged to blow if a large-scale assault hit. The Foundation was taking no chance with whatever they had found in Egypt. What could they be keeping locked up below? As Dr. Wright walked through the long tunnel leading to the staircase, he could see a series of rules marked on the wall. No open flames allowed within SCP-4001. No firearms or bladed weapons allowed within SCP-4001. All writing utensils brought into SCP-4001 must be approved by a majority of the O5 Council. Violating these conditions could cause a CK-class restructuring scenario, or an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Dr. Wright's mind raced as he entered the massive antechamber and descended the staircase, but he wasn't prepared for what he saw. It was a library the biggest library he had ever seen, with bookcases stretched as far as the eye could see. The library was far bigger than the warehouse looked from the outside, and Dr. Wright assumed it must be a disguise built on top of the much bigger, older facility that had been discovered by the Foundation. It wouldn't be the first time the Foundation found something that didn't conform to the laws of Euclidean geometry. SCP locations often played by their own rules. As Dr. Wright exited the staircase and walked up to the first bookcase, he could swear he heard rustling sounds among the shelves. Was something moving? He hadn't seen anyone walking the aisles when he descended the staircase, and he was pretty sure he was alone here, wasn't he? Making things stranger, a quick look at the bookcase didn't show any books he was familiar with. None had standard titles. In fact, they all seemed to follow a simple format each title a different individual person. All books looked the exact same. Same binding, same thickness, same number of pages. Was this some sort of SCP reference library? Suddenly, a hand slapped down on Dr. Wright's shoulder and his heart nearly jumped out of his chest. He turned to see a gray-haired man in an SCP lab coat extending a hand to him. Dr. Waylon Henricks, chief scientist in charge of testing at SCP-4001. You must be Dr. Wright. He didn't give Dr. Wright a chance to respond. Dr. Henricks didn't seem like the kind of man to be very interested in what others had to say. Yes, yes. About time the Foundation sent me a new research assistant. I suppose you have a lot of questions. Dr. Wright was supposed to be a researcher, not an assistant. He didn't suppose it would do any good to point that out. When Dr. Wright tried to question what it was that he'd be researching, Dr. Henricks told him that it would be easier to show than explain. With that, he motioned Dr. Wright to a nearby table, where one of the countless identical books on the shelves was waiting. He nodded at the book, prompting the younger doctor to turn it over and read the title. He couldn't believe what he saw. There on the front of the book was his name, Herman Wright. Dr. Wright looked at his colleague in confusion, and Dr. Henricks motioned for him to take a look. It was written in a language that he had never seen before but was somehow instantly recognizable and understandable. And the book really was about him. Every detail of his life had been written down in this volume, starting with his birth, containing details that no one but he knew. His whole life story was here. From his childhood to his education to his eventual recruitment by the SCP Foundation. But the book wasn't completed. The last line that had been written described his entry into the secured confines of SCP-4001 that very day. Dr. Henricks had a mad glint in his eye. Are you starting to understand? One for each of us. 
Every person who has ever lived, roughly 120 billion people since the dawn of man, their lives all written down in these books. Every time someone is born, their book appears in this library, and their story gets written as it happens. The Foundation has been monitoring this site since the 1800s, but it's been operating much longer than that, since the dawn of recorded history. Dr. Henricks passed Dr. Wright another book. It was simply titled, The Hunter, and it chronicled the life of a prehistoric man who spent his days searching for wild game. He lived 23 violent, monotonous years before his story ended abruptly when a saber-toothed tiger decided it was interested in the same mammoth he was hunting. This must have been one of the oldest books in the library. A book for every person on Earth. Dr. Wright could only imagine what the scale of this massive library must be. Dr. Henrich explained that mapping the library was a huge challenge before producing a map from his pocket and laying it out on the desk. You're at base camp. This is where new births generate on the shelves along with books pertaining to the first humans. If you want to drag down specific books, you'll need to know where you're going. We've established base camps around the library to mark significant eras in human history with notable books. At each camp, you'll find generators, supplies, and beacons to light your way. If you're going back far enough, you could be traveling for days or even weeks. Dr. Wright was fascinated by this bizarre location containing the sum total of human experience within its massively expanding walls. But there was one thing he couldn't figure out. Just why was this seemingly harmless location featuring constantly changing books the most securely guarded SCP he had ever encountered? Dr. Henricks knew he was referring to the extensive rules he had must have seen as he entered. The other doctor reached into his pocket and said, Let's just say that around here, the pen is mightier than the sword. He pressed the pen into Dr. Wright's hand and flipped open the back page of his book. It was blank, the rest of his story waiting to be written. What's something you've always wanted in your life, Dr. Wright? Think literally. Why not put it in your book or remove something you've always wanted gone? Slowly, Dr. Wright thought back to his teenage years and recalled an injury that he suffered in a mugging that damaged his leg and left him with a limp. He nervously used the pen to scribble out the words and sentences describing the event. After a few seconds, he felt a headache and suffered from a slight nosebleed. After that, the limp and pain from the injury was gone, and he could no longer recall the event. You see, Dr. Wright, that's the secret of SCP-4001, Dr. Henrik said with a mad gleam in his eye. This library doesn't just let us read the history of humanity, it lets us write it. That's why you're here to test the limit of this power and see what this library can do for the Foundation. Dr. Henrik soon provided Dr. Wright with footage of some of the many tests conducted in the library, and what Dr. Wright saw amazed him. The books could rewrite the laws of nature with alarming speed, as some unfortunate D-Class personnel found out. D-0546 was brought into a room with a full head of hair. The D-Class personnel was instructed to scribble, lost all hair into his book and he soon started scratching his head as he rapidly started shedding hair. After less than two minutes, the man was completely bald. D-0567, a young woman who had been brutally injured when attacked by an escaping SCP, was bedridden and would never walk again, according to all the Foundation doctors. As the D-Class personnel used a pen to scribble over the line in her book describing her injury, Dr. Wright watched as she suffered a minor nosebleed and then sat up getting out of bed as if she had never been injured and no longer remembered being attacked. Dr. Claire Williams, a Foundation researcher sick with cancer, wrote into the book about curing her symptoms and then addressed the camera explaining that this was her third time altering her own book. Her lymphoma symptoms had returned after several months and two years respectively, but it seemed that as long as she continued to make changes to her book, then she could keep the cancer at bay indefinitely. But not all the tests ended with positive results, as Dr. Wright moved on to another selection of tapes labeled Mortality Tests. A D-Class personnel who was given a fatal dose of drugs and then had their death erased from their book 45 minutes later miraculously returned to life, but showed significant cognitive deficits after. Another D-Class, an older woman killed in a containment breach had her death erased from the book, but came back deeply disturbed. She survived 15 days in containment, repeating, send me back, let me go, over and over again before committing suicide. 
A D-Class personnel killed 28 days prior was brought back by writing, returned back to life in their book, but died again just 13 minutes later from a cerebral hemorrhage. But it was the next tape that was the most disturbing. It documented a new book that was written by the Foundation, depicting the life of a fictional man down to the slightest detail. It was carefully placed in the correct position in the archives, resembling all the other books. And Dr. Wright watched the tape in amazement as the man resembling the fictional character created for the book spontaneously generated in SCP-4001. Almost immediately, the man started vomiting blood and died less than two minutes later. The book carefully described all the things he died from, and stated that this was exactly as it was supposed to be. The fake book then disappeared into the archives, never to be seen again. The archive knew when it was being used to play with life and death, and it didn't want any part of it. The next tape wasn't a test at all. It was a video interview showing a Greek-speaking scientist speaking with an ancient-looking old man, found living in the archive slowly after its discovery by the Foundation. The man, who described himself as the Watcher of Alexandria Eternal, believed he was keeping the archive safe from the Roman Empire and the other invaders. He was unaware that thousands of years had passed since his watch began. He had been using the books to write himself another day of life, and to cure his ills ever since he began guarding the library. At the conclusion of the interview, he asked to leave, and this request was granted by the Foundation. The ancient man died of old age shortly after setting foot out of the library. While the library can't technically cure death, it does seem to have nearly limitless ability to prolong life, as long as someone is willing to stay close by and never forgets to write themselves another day. Where did this incredible power come from? An O5 authorized investigation into the origins of SCP-4001 revealed that under the archive's carpet is a concrete floor covered by a layer of ash. The ash was carbon dated to between 70 and 80,000 years old. And further analysis revealed the ash is likely to be the remains of burnt wood and paper, despite there being no known records within the archive itself about a major fire having occurred there. Dr. Wright didn't have much time to dwell on the library's great power of life, because he was suddenly shaken from his thoughts by the sound of alarms. Was the library being breached? No, it was Foundation officials, led by a man recognized as Dr. Lincoln Abrams, the very man who assigned him to this project and he did not look happy. He explained that he knew what Dr. Waylon Henricks had been up to, writing in books, changing the lives of subordinates in an attempt to play God. He knew about everything, of course, because he had read Dr. Henricks' own book. He knew all of the doctor's secrets. He knew everything. No, I'm so close, Dr. Abrams. I know I can crack the archive's rules. There's a way to conquer death here, I can feel it. Dr. Abrams was done listening, and with a wave of his hand, Foundation Security took Dr. Henricks into custody for a debriefing and likely demotion. Dr. Abrams then turned his attention to the new young researcher. Dr. Wright, eventful first day, I gather. I'll appoint a new lead scientist shortly, but until then, don't disrupt anything. Remember, the Archive is writing our stories as we speak. It's not very happy with Dr. Henricks. Make sure your story turns out better. And with that, Dr. Abrams and his security team departed, leaving Dr. Herman Wright alone with the endless archives of Alexandria Eternal, wondering what would be written in his own tome, as the sound of new books popping into existence filled the air with ominous rustling. It skitters in the dark, its insect-like legs tapping across the marble floors as terrified Foundation researchers flee. They hear its voice, the deep, silky tones of an elderly British man spouting nonsense like the nightmare is a dream to the nameless slug that wanders across minefield in the remains of deer and kings while the scientists run the creature gains on them it's fast impossibly fast while they still try to escape down this darkened hallway ear-splitting containment breach sirens blast through the air they may try to escape but it's futile in a sense they're already dead. All they are now is prey for the heart of darkness. When someone says the word heart, there are a lot of images that come to mind. You might think of Valentine's Day, heart-shaped cards and candies. You might think of heartbreak, rejection, loss. You might simply think of a heart in the anatomical sense, the vital organ that pumps blood through our bodies. 
It's unlikely, though, that you would associate the word heart with terror, destruction, and countless deaths. However, employees of the SCP Foundation might think differently, especially if they've ever had a run-in with SCP-058. Much of the information about 058's discovery is highly classified, but the few details that are known paint a chilling picture. At an SCP Foundation test site, the day was proceeding as usual, with scientists and security personnel going about their regular daily tasks. There was no hint of danger in the air, beyond the base level that always comes with setting foot in an SCP Foundation site, at least. Several researchers were performing an experiment, the specifics of which have been expunged from all records, involving the carcass of a cow. When a researcher, Dr. C, placed his hands on the specimen and prepared to dissect it, he was shocked to feel a pulse coming from the supposedly dead animal. Dr. C shared his surprise with his colleagues, but his concerns were dismissed immediately. Clearly, this was a corpse. He was imagining things, they said. After all, he was relatively new to the job. It was probably just nerves. The head researcher, Dr. L, insisted that he take over. Pushing Dr. C to the side, Dr. L began to make an incision into the animal's chest. As he did, he too felt something peculiar. There was no doubt about it. This dead cow had a beating heart. He looked up from his work to tell the other researchers to explain what he felt. But by then, it was too late. Something horrible was already happening. With a stomach-churning sound of squishing flesh, the cow's heart burst from its chest and flopped onto the floor. It was terrifyingly large, and all the doctors jumped back from the sight of it. Four spindly, spider-like legs poked through the flesh of the heart, and it began to quickly skitter about the room. Researchers reviewing the security footage would later note that it didn't just move randomly. It seemed agitated, angry at being discovered, and it displayed immediate hostility towards the scientists in the room. Four tentacles next unfurled from within the heart and stretched out into full, writhing appendages. They moved frighteningly fast as the heart whipped around the room, and were coated in sharp spines. Finally, a stinger poked out from the back of the heart, where the whole of the superior vena cava should be. All of the scientists leapt into action, with one reaching for a scalpel and another moving towards the door. But before the men could so much as call for help, the tentacles wrapped around them and ripped them to shreds. Hearing screams coming from the laboratory, security personnel arrived to contain the threat. However, they were no match for the strange creature that would soon be known as SCP-058. It tore through the security team in minutes, leaving their tattered remains in its wake. Much to the horror of the surviving personnel at the site, SCP-058 was able to escape containment and make its way to a neighboring town. Reports of the incident said that, when the creature reached the town, you could hear the screaming for miles. SCP-058 carved a path of violence through the town, attacking everything in sight with its stinger and tentacles, and leaving a trail of strange fluid from its stinger. Dozens of citizens were killed, and 70% of the buildings were completely destroyed. When agents were dispatched to the location to retrieve the creature, they were shocked to see the level of destruction caused by something so small. The scent of blood and smoke filled the air and severed limbs littered the ground alongside splintered wood and collapsed brick. The survivors removed from the wreckage were inconsolable, only calming down once they were given an amnestic to erase their memory of the encounter with SCP-058. They had to be given new lives as well, as there was nothing left of their old ones. SCP Foundation agents were only able to capture and contain SCP-058 after it was crushed by pieces of a building that collapsed on top of it. They found it flattened under a slab of stone, legs flailing uselessly, tentacles limp. The agents were able to safely remove the debris and bring in the heart without any more casualties that day. Once it was brought into captivity, the heart was contained for three weeks and remained largely quiet during that time. It was almost inconceivable that this small creature hadn't been killed in the incident, but the Foundation would soon learn that this creature was freakishly durable. It escaped once more while being transferred to an SCP containment site, again causing injuries and death. Having only experienced SCP-058 in its docile, injured form, 
The team responsible for the transfer was unprepared for the sheer power and violence the creature was capable of. It was able to escape an armored car and make its way into a forest, where it eviscerated several squirrels and rabbits. Or rather, they were believed to be squirrels and rabbits. The remains were too mutilated to properly identify. It was only finally apprehended after being crushed by an armored tank. But even this didn't kill the creature, and it was transferred to Armed Biocontainment Area 14, where it remains to this day. There is a great deal about SCP-058 that is horrifying, but there is one attribute it has shown in captivity that would make even the most seasoned researchers' skin crawl. Though it has no anatomical capacity for speech, no throat, vocal cords, or even a respiratory system, SCP-058 speaks. Not only does it speak, but it speaks constantly, in the deep voice of an elderly British man. No one knows who the voice might belong to, or if it belongs to anyone at all. Perhaps it belongs only to SCP-058 somehow. As is often the case with SCPs that are capable of speech, there have been multiple attempts to interview the creature, and each time, it ended in complete disaster. The only interview with an available transcript, Interview 05804, was conducted by Dr. Johnston with several personnel in the room for additional security. Dr. Johnston attempted to get at the origins of the creature, asking for its name and where it was from. The creature responded in cryptic, unsettling poetry, giving answers to simple questions with, I had dreams of the queen, wonders that lived inside the hearts of love and silent treatments for all the elderly that I knew were once whole. After the fourth recitation of a similar verse from the heart, Personnel D-067 made a comment on the creepy nature of its responses, almost as if it was offended by the remark. SCP-058 immediately stretched a tentacle across the room, wrapped it around D-067 and lifted him into the air. He began screaming and clawing at the tentacle, in an attempt to free himself as his fellow personnel tried to help him. They grabbed at the tentacle, but found their hands pierced and bloodied by the spikes that cover it. Dr. Johnston commanded 058 to let him go, but it did not oblige. Instead, the man was crushed to death by the tentacle, and his limp body left to drop to the floor. The interview concluded with a single statement from the nightmarish heart. The sensual violence of lust is all the assurance you will ever need to know the worth of life. SCP-058 never seems to say anything that has to do with the people or events around it. It speaks in the same haunting, poetic language even when it's attacking or killing something. No matter what happens to it, what is done to it, or what anyone says, SCP-058 keeps talking and its tone of voice with the pace of speech never changing, and further attempts to interview it have been abandoned due to the safety risk involved. So what happened to the creature often called the Heart of Darkness? Where is it now? SCP-058 is kept in an isolated containment chamber made of reinforced heat-resistant steel with a backing of reinforced concrete. In order to placate its bloodthirsty, carnivorous tendencies, the creature is given a live cow every three days. It is uncertain how exactly SCP-058 eats, given that it does not have a mouth or stomach, but every time it is finished with a cow, only bones remain. Routine maintenance is conducted on a tight schedule, and the heart is never allowed out of its containment area under any circumstances. After two previous escapes from containment, the Foundation is not taking any chances. Its constant speech is recorded via audio devices that are running at all times. Out of concern for their safety and mental health, no personnel are permitted to listen to recordings of SCP-058 speaking for more than 30 minutes at a time. It is unknown what will happen to someone who listens for longer, but it has been suggested that the consequences could be dire. If the creature ever escapes again, the containment site is ordered to be destroyed via the detonation of an on-site nuclear weapon. Under no circumstances can it be allowed to make its way out into the world again. Even with all these precautions in place, SCP-058 has been responsible for over 150 deaths at its current containment site. There are some at the Foundation who have campaigned for SCP-058 to be terminated, believing that there is more harm than good done by keeping it alive. However, all attempts to terminate it have so far failed. No matter how much physical trauma the heart suffers, 
it does not seem to be able to be killed. It can only be incapacitated for a short time. There is a classic horror story by Edgar Allan Poe called The Telltale Heart. In it, a man murders an old man and buries his body beneath the floorboards of his home. There, even though the old man is certainly dead, the murderer swears he can hear the beating of the heart coming up through the floorboards. No matter what he does to quiet the sound, he cannot escape it, and is eventually driven mad by the incessant beating of the dead man's heart. SCP-058 may not be a man's heart, a human heart, or even a real heart at all. However, just like the telltale heart, it continues to impossibly beat no matter how hard anyone tries to stop it. The steady thump of its pulse haunts the SCP Foundation, a grim reminder that there is something within its walls that can, and will, kill everyone it can if given the chance. It couldn't be destroyed by collapsed buildings, an armored tank, or an army of experts, and the contingency plan of a nuclear blast is not even guaranteed to work. It is entirely possible that, once the facility has been laid waste and all the staff have been incinerated, and the smoke has finally cleared, the heart of darkness will still be there, still beating, still talking, and still killing. From gigantic, indestructible, self-regenerating reptiles to enormous tentacled telepathic organisms, it should come as no surprise that the SCP Foundation has gone head-to-head -head against a lot of large-scale aggressors, or LSAs, in its time. Naturally, a creature of heightened size and aggression can often prove challenging to contain, and the threat these LSAs pose is often far too big to ignore. But anyone familiar with the Foundation will tell you they're not above using any methods necessary to keep these creatures contained. Huge vats of molecular acid, impenetrable cells, disposable D-class personnel, even other SCPs. But what other SCPs could possibly be big enough and tough enough to handle some of the Foundation's biggest and baddest? Meet SCP-5514, otherwise known as the Dragon Slayer. While it might sound like something out of an anime, SCP-5514 is a massive robotic mech designed to take on the worst other SCPs can throw at it. For any who are unfamiliar with the term, a mech or mecha usually refers to an upright standing machine or automaton controlled by a human pilot. What distinguishes a mech from a vehicle is their often humanoid shape, standing bipedally and they are often hundreds of meters tall. All of this is true of SCP-5514. And, in fact, given that it requires a trained member of Foundation staff to operate it, the mech itself requires very little in the way of containment. Only members of Mobile Task Force Ada-5 are trained and authorized to pilot SCP-5514. This is one of the SCP Foundation's specialized units, specifically designed to deal with the threat of large-scale aggressors, much like SCP-5514 itself. But SCP-5514 wasn't discovered or captured by the Foundation for use for the containment of LSAs, nor was it stolen from a foreign military or found buried under the ground. Then, where did it come from, and who built it? Working with the Global Occult Coalition and the Government of High Brazil, an anomalous island off the west coast of Ireland, the Foundation themselves constructed SCP-5514 using various anomalous methods and techniques. In 1988, a Foundation site was destroyed by an unidentified LSA, highlighting the inadequacy of the current defenses against these larger, more damage-resistant creatures. The Foundation, the Coalition, and High Brazil formed a joint operation, the Key Project, and examined SCP-2406, an automaton 93 meters tall thought to be created by ancient Mechanites. Together, the Key Project opted to create their own similar machine, viewing it as the best way to defend against further incursions with large-scale aggressors. The construction of SCP-5514 began in 1990. The intention of all parties involved in the Key Project, including the Foundation, was that the Dragon Slayer would be deployed in the event of an attack by an LSA. It would arrive at cities under attack and immediately engage large-scale aggressors in combat. Building of the mech continued at a consistent pace for eight years. However, it was the occurrence of SCP-5391 and subsequent intervention by the O5 Council that accelerated the creation of the Dragon Slayer by any means necessary. On June 30, 1998, 
a number of seismic disturbances were detected, including tsunamis, tremors, and volcanic activity both underwater and above ground. What followed was the appearance of multiple large-scale aggressors, which would soon become designated as SCP-5391, the exact kind of scenario that the Dragon Slayer was being built for had already arrived and the mech was still far from completion. While the Foundation and its allies deployed forces to drive the enormous creatures back to the ocean, something needed to be done to bring SCP-5514 into the fight, and fast. The O5 Council authorized the use of anomalous materials in the continued construction of the Dragon Slayer, both to speed up the process and have it ready for deployment, but also to give the mech every advantage against the abundance of large-scale aggressors from SCP-5391. As a result, SCP-5514 was designed to incorporate features and technology far beyond that of any conventional military-grade weapons. The first hurdle? How do you power a machine the size of SCP-5514? Naturally, with the most gigantic nuclear furnace there is the sun. More specifically, a perpetually stable miniaturized sun known as SCP-037. Even though it only has a diameter of 2 inches, this little sucker is better than premium fuel. The surface temperature of SCP-037 is around 5,000 Kelvin, generating plenty of energy to power the SCP-5514 mech. Stored in the Dragon Slayer's chest, this mini-sun is kept stable by subdimensional portals that vent excess energy off this plane of reality, stopping the mech, its pilot, and anything around it from melting. In fact, SCP-037 produces so much juice that only 1% of its energy output is enough to fully power SCP-5514. Now that's the power source sorted, but how do you solve the weight problem? Given the sheer size of SCP-5514, it would be easy for it to be cumbersome and potentially cause catastrophic collateral damage to its surrounding area. Well, the mech's weight is a problem for somewhere else. A whole other dimension, in fact. Much like the excess heat from its power source, various heavy portions of the SCP-5514 mech have their weight shunted off to a tiny pocket dimension. It was ensured during the creation of the mech that this alteration was perfectly calculated, so that SCP-5514 wouldn't lose any mass or density, so it operates as if it were only a fraction of its actual weight. Of course, being weightless makes flight a whole lot easier. Oh, did we forget to mention that? SCP-5514 can fly as well. This feature actually became a part of the mech completely by accident during the construction of SCP-5514, when an attempt to regulate the mech's internal circulation of air led to it having its own gravity field. This allowed SCP-5514 to fly without the aid of any turbines or other means. While this was an unintentional mistake, no attempt has ever been made to correct for it for fear that it could lead to SCP-5514 being grounded permanently. Naturally, going up against creatures so large that they require their own subcategory means that SCP-5514 needs an equally formidable arsenal. So let's move on to talk weaponry. Mounted on the mech's shoulder is a Beowulf Sigurd railgun, an anomalous weapon that also doesn't obey the laws of physics at all. The Beowulf Sigurd uses alternate gravity to affect the weight of its targets, causing projectiles to impact with higher velocity. Even the thickest-skinned LSAs wouldn't want to be staring down the barrel end of one of those. Big guns aside, the SCP-5514 mech also wields a cold iron sword. Over 65 feet long, this weapon was contributed to the Dragon Slayer by the High Brazil Royal Court, members of the collaborative key project that created the mech. Sure, a large-scale aggressor with thicker hide might take a few extra swings to draw blood, but it will feel those swings for a long time after, since any wounds inflicted by the cold iron sword will not regenerate. Serving as less of an offensive weapon, the SCP-5514 mech also features a unique armament known as the Thousand Word Arrows. As pretentious as it might sound, Within the mech are seven poets. Their role is to write and recite poems that detail the slaying of monsters, and these recitals are then broadcast from the Dragon Slayer. On the surface, this seems to have no practical applications during a fight with LSAs. However, the goal of the Thousand Word Arrows is a form of psychological warfare, 
The recital of poems telling of the mech's victory and the defeat of large-scale aggressors is intended to have the effect of demoralizing SCP-5514's adversaries while encouraging the pilot during combat. Additionally, worn atop the head of the SCP-5514 mech almost like a hat is a discus with plasma-coated edges. If the Dragon Slayer needs to deal damage at range, then it can hurl this disc and recall it immediately thanks to built-in electromagnets. In emergency scenarios, if the Cold Iron Sword is damaged or dropped and irretrievable, SCP-5514 is also equipped with an additional melee weapon. Stored in the right arm of the mech is a holdout plasma wrist blade. This superheated blade is strong enough to cut through almost anything. However, this blade is strictly to be used as a backup weapon. Finally, should all else fail, one of SCP-5514's greatest strengths can also be used as a deadly weapon. The emergency sun vent allows a fraction of the excess power from SCP-037 to be released, at the risk of causing massive damage, not only to LSAs, but to any civilians or structures nearby. It is because of the destructive risk involved that this weapon is only authorized to be used as a final resort. And luckily, SCP-5514 is currently undefeated. Since the arrival of multiple large-scale aggressors as a result of SCP-5391, the SCP-5514 mech has managed to successfully eliminate 12 of these LSA creatures, either by terminating or otherwise incapacitating them. Given that its completion was fast-tracked through the use of anomalous elements, SCP-5514's first combat deployments also served as field tests of the mech's operation and the various weapons and features. Arriving in Tokyo overseen by the Foundation's own Captain Rosales and Dr. Kaori, SCP-5514's first target was a creature designated LSA Wake-02, as well as several other unidentified large creatures. As the LSA was about to attack Tokyo Harbor, SCP-5514 was dispatched, its arrival heralded by the thousand-word arrows. Champion, champion, exalt in the glory of the Dragon Slayer, the poets recited. Surprisingly, the poetry worked, hearing it had a noticeable effect on LSA Wake-02, causing the creature to back away shrieking. With a single throw of the rounded, recoiling plasma, SCP-5514 immediately beheaded Wake-02, damaging a number of the other nearby LSAs as it retrieved the disc via its electromagnets. Once again, the thousand-word arrows cheered on the mech and the pilot reciting, The vicious beast slain, gone to those which were once bane. After dispatching several of the minor LSAs with its cold iron sword, SCP-5514 became aware that Wake-02 was not fully down for the count. A second head had protruded from the mouth of the creatures first, issuing some sort of retreat call to the remaining LSAs in Tokyo Harbor. This second head then shot towards SCP-5514, narrowly missing its leg but allowing other LSAs to close the distance and prepare an attack. Luckily, the SCP-5514 mech's sword cleaved the beast in two. The mech began firing on the remains of Wake-02 with its Beowulf Sigurd railgun launching itself into the air and flying towards the target while bringing its cold iron sword down through the air. With a single motion, SCP-5514 brought the blade all the way down the LSA's body, from the creature's head to its caudal fin, gutting the large-scale aggressor and splitting its entire body in two. After one final squirm, both halves were finally still. SCP-5514 had passed its first field test. The mech functioned exactly as designed, all its various weapons and features working in tandem to defeat a creature far too large and powerful for any conventional force to handle. And thus the deed was done. Exult, exult in the glory of the Dragon Slayer. The thousand word arrows called out as the other LSAs retreated. One cannot help but feel cautiously optimistic about our chances of survival, knowing that the Foundation has SCP-5514 as the first line of defense against huge, monstrous beings that threaten humanity. As the situation with SCP-5391 continues, the SCP-5514 mech remains on the front line, standing between innocent human beings and the looming shapes of multiple large-scale aggressors. With creatures that pose such a large-scale threat, it certainly is lucky that disparate groups were able to put aside their differences and work together to build a large-scale mech. And because they did, now we have the Dragon Slayer on our side. Are you sitting comfortably? 
We know a good chair is hard to find. Maybe you're watching this on your phone while you lie in bed. Or maybe you're watching at your desk, sitting in an office chair. Maybe you're even watching it while you're in the bathroom. It's fine, we're not here to judge. For our money, you just can't beat a nice, classic wooden chair with soft leather upholstery. Call us old-fashioned, but some things just never go out of style. Take a chair like SCP-1609, for example. This fine piece of mahogany was once a chair that simply couldn't be beat in its quest to bring its users a little dose of comfort and refinement in their daily life. Tell us, have you ever been on your feet all day, just walking and walking and walking, and at a certain point you're just begging for a nice comfy chair that'll let you take the weight off your feet for a little while? You would have been SCP-1609's favorite kind of person. After all, it was the only chair that literally sought out weary travelers, and even did you the courtesy of tucking itself in. That's not a metaphor, either. SCP-1609 could literally teleport to nearby people who needed to sit down and didn't have a chair to fulfill that desire. It was nothing but a nice, helpful anomaly that wanted to help people rest when they needed it most. The more observant members of you have noticed that we've been using the past tense so far. That's because while SCP-1609 is still an active anomaly, it isn't a chair anymore. And this transformation wasn't something that SCP-1609 planned, anticipated, or even wanted. The story of 1609's transformation even strikes to the core of one of the Foundation's oldest and most bitterly held rivalries with another group of interest. It's the tale of how a helpful piece of anomalous furniture became a paranoid killer. But first we need to talk about containment procedures. Like a word you see so often that it starts to lose meaning, containment and specific containment procedures are concepts so integral to the very existence of the SCP Foundation that it is easy to overlook or forget about them. They're one of the three core pillars of the Foundation's mission statement. Secure. Contain. Protect. Because of the centrality of containment to the Foundation's core principles, one of the most valuable roles on the SCP Foundation payroll is that of the Containment Specialist, a vast team of experts who work with researchers to figure out the best way to keep every anomaly contained, based on their unique abilities and attributes. They're zookeepers, archivists, guards, security and intelligence experts, magicians, practitioners of ritual, scientists, and so much more. In short, they're anything they need to be in order to adapt to the ever-evolving containment needs of the anomalies they keep under lock and key. And containment isn't easy. Aside from the rare safe class SCPs, which require incredibly minimal containment resources, the containment of most SCPs extracts some kind of cost, whether that be financial, time, effort, or in some particularly dark cases, human life. Some SCPs like SCP-974 and SCP-2845 require the sacrifice of human children to prevent worse fates befalling many others. Other SCPs, like the infamous SCP-231, require the Foundation to do horrifying things to the SCP itself to prevent it from manifesting some even more horrifying anomalous traits. And a third but equally inconvenient kind of SCP, like SCP-682 and SCP-076, require huge numbers of heavily armed guards with powerful weapons to keep their deadly prisoners locked away, often at a massive risk to their own lives. Containment isn't easy, but it's ultimately the very thing that makes the SCP Foundation the organization it is. If they were instead on a quest to kill and destroy every anomaly they could get their hands on, then they'd be the Global Occult Coalition, the UN's answer to the SCP Foundation that prefers to seek, disable, and destroy rather than secure, contain, and protect. It's the primary characteristic that differentiates these two titans of the anomalous world who regularly come to blows. And right at the heart of that difference is SCP-1609. As we mentioned earlier, SCP-1609 went through a transformation that changed everything. But the SCP Foundation never actually knew about the anomaly prior to that transformation taking place. It first came to their attention when it literally manifested within a containment cell in Storage Site-08 
making the rare move of willingly submitting itself to the Foundation containment. But what showed up in that cell certainly wasn't a chair. When 1609 appeared, all it looked like was a pile of trash, specifically splinters, wood chippings, furniture nails, and scraps of bleached leather and fabric. Anything that suddenly infiltrates a secure Foundation containment site is cause for concern, even a bunch of wood scraps. So the site director sent in an armed guard to investigate the mysterious pile of debris. Researchers watching over a surveillance feed were surprised when the guard suddenly entered a state of heightened distress. He fell to his knees, coughing and spluttering until he expelled a considerable amount of blood from his mouth and nose. He then collapsed on the ground next to the pile of debris, dead. An investigation following this incident found that the guard had died after a sudden influx of jagged metal and wood had teleported inside of him, tearing his lungs apart from the inside and causing the guard to die a painful and horrific death. Naturally, the site personnel were somewhat concerned by this development. They sent in a D-Class to investigate further, but were surprised to find that the D-Class in question was somehow completely fine. The pile of debris that would soon be designated SCP-1609 made no attempt to harm the D-Class as it had the guard, and finding out why this was the case came as a side effect of figuring out exactly what had happened to SCP-1609. Through a rigorous investigation involving more than one secret Foundation mole, they discovered that SCP-1609 had previously been in the possession of, you guessed it, the Global Occult Coalition. Back then, it was just a helpful chair you once knew and loved, until the GOC had the bright idea of forcing it into a wood chipper in order to destroy it due to its connection to someone called the Carpenter. But all the GOC's attempt actually succeeded in doing was altering its form and completely changing its personality. To put it in simple terms, SCP-1609 is now a pile of possibly sentient teleporting wood and metal chippings that suffers from a nasty case of PTSD. The incident with the wood chipper traumatized SCP-1609, and its anxiety is triggered by anything that reminds it of the GOC or the wood chipper incident. This includes wearing formal clothing, lab coats, protective clothing, jumpsuits, and particularly body armor, but also includes anyone carrying weapons, appearing outwardly aggressive using common GOC lingo, or even mentioning the GOC in SCP-1609's proximity. If any of this happens, it's extremely likely that SCP-1609 will resort to its only natural defense mechanism, which is teleporting its debris into the lungs of anyone it considers to be a threat. The guard had received this grisly punishment because his clothes, weapon, and overall manner caused SCP-1609 to regard him as a threat and react accordingly. You may think this is overkill on 1609's part, but if you were just trying to help out the chairless people of the world and someone fed you into a wood chipper, you'd probably be a little jumpy too. Since these early days, the Foundation has learned to apply a more tender touch when it comes to dealing with SCP-1609, and the brilliant containment specialists even figured out a way to keep 1609 happily contained by placing it in a flower bed inside its containment chamber where its wood chips get to serve as mulch for a variety of flowers and plants. All attending researchers and guards dress in plain clothes and adopt a loose, pleasant attitude while inside. Whenever they're around, they make a point of saying how beautiful the flower bed is, so that the disfigured anomaly that only ever wanted to be helpful can still feel like it's doing something nice. Because of these containment procedures, breaches involving SCP-1609 have remained in the single digits. It is a perfect example of less really being more when it comes to containment. The head researcher on the SCP-1609 case, Dr. Sievert, released an internal document permanently affixed to the file like a kind of cautionary signpost. It's a clear expression of exasperation and rage at the actions of the Global Occult Coalition, reading, SCP-1609 represents a perfect example of the flaws inherent in the operating procedure of the GOC, and serves as a cautionary tale for any members of the Foundation who disagree with our practices on containing dangerous objects. Prior to the Coalition getting their hands on this, it was perfectly harmless. A chair which teleports to you when you need to see it is normal compared to most of the stuff that we deal with on a regular basis. When they put it through a wood chipper, it got hurt, scared, and angry, so it lashed out at them. By trying to protect the world by destroying it, they inadvertently made the situation a whole lot worse. 
SCP-1609 went from being harmless to deadly in the space of a few minutes because of the GOC, and we had to clean up the mess. Thankfully, SCP-1609 is pretty simple for us to deal with, so long as we don't have to do anything stupid around it. It won't fight back and it won't try to leave. Even if it does, it usually comes back, and I think I've worked out why. It came to us because it was afraid of the people who had hurt it. That's why it always comes back. It's afraid of the rest of the world now, and it's looking to us for protection. This is why we have special containment procedures instead of special destruction procedures. If you break something, it's broken forever. When you try to destroy an anomaly, you can't take back your mistakes. That's what SCP-1609 has to tell us. This is why we're right and the GOC is wrong, people. But of course, there are two sides to every story, and it's important to understand the GOC's perspective on this whole mess. To them, this has never been SCP-1609. It's KTE-0937 Velveteen, aka the Sixth Chair. It was labeled as the Sixth because for the GOC, this chair was merely one part of a wider investigation. It belonged to a six-piece furniture set created by a dangerous anomalous person of interest named the Carpenter for a classified customer. The GOC was able to intercept this deal and kill the Carpenter and his customer in the process. After that, all that was left was to eliminate the anomalous objects, and five of them were incinerated without incident. However, before they could do the same to the sixth chair, they experienced an incinerator malfunction. Rather than just waiting for the incinerator to be fixed, a member of GOC personnel decided to rush the job and run the chair through a wood chipper. It was at this point that its pieces first lashed out invading the lungs of this negligent GOC member along with five others, killing them all. It was shortly after that that SCP-1609 manifested in Foundation containment. Much like Dr. Sievert did for the Foundation, Assistant Director Kipling, one of the GOC's Legion of Middle Managers, affixed a note to the profile of KTE-0937 Velveteen that reads, KTE-0937 Velveteen is an object lesson in the importance of following proper operating procedures. Due to the lack of vigilance by the agent on the scene, the object's threat level was escalated. The object itself was not successfully disposed of, and it has since fallen into the hands of a hostile agency. A single failure by a single operative resulted in the deaths of six. Remember this next time you think about cutting corners. And that's a good lesson for everyone. Whether you're trying to destroy an anomalous piece of furniture or keeping its remains happy so they don't try to kill you, cutting corners is always a fast track to failure. Why do so many of the indigenous cultures of the colder regions of North America seem to share the same legend? A legend that tells of a monster that lurks in the forests, bringing cold and death to any that meet it. This creature is an omen of famine, a territorial beast that preys on human beings. Some cultures describe it as an unholy abomination, a spirit of winter and a warning against the dangers of selfishness, one that is created whenever a person resorts to cannibalism in order to survive. It will gladly devour any man, woman, or child that wanders into its territory, holding a horrifying and insatiable hunger for human flesh. So how did so many cultures end up with the same story? Could it be because it's real? Depictions of the beast vary, but it is most commonly recognized by its tall skeletal form, like a body exhumed from the grave, even carrying the stench of death and decay with it. Anyone who encounters one risks being eaten or transformed into a creature just like it. The monster's name means an evil spirit that devours mankind, though to even say the name is taboo, as it's believed to give power to the beast. Of course, these are all just legends, right? Stories to warn against the dangers of greed and selfishness, but otherwise nothing to fear. There's no proof that such a beast could actually be roaming the frozen wastes. Many at the SCP Foundation felt the same way, until they heard about SCP-323, hmm. the Wendigo's skull. Kept under lock and key by the Foundation with around-the-clock surveillance, SCP-323 is an anomalous object with ties to the various Wendigo legends. As the object's moniker suggests, SCP-323 is a skull. Not a human skull, mind you. It more closely resembles a cervid skull. Cervids are a family of mammals that include most varieties of deer, elk, and other similar animals. 
and this particular cervid skull sports a tall pair of antlers. SCP-323 is definitely not a fresh skull either. It shows signs of weathering and a few scars across the surface, looking as if the bone has been bleached and eroded through exposure to the elements. The skull is also missing its lower jaw, and has a sizable hole on the rear underside that may have been carved using stone tools. SCP-323 is kept restrained inside an armored container within a concrete containment cell, and personnel are only ever allowed near it to check the restraints for signs of damage. Additionally, any Foundation staff that enter SCP-323 cell must be accompanied by an armed security officer, and in the event of a containment breach, the entire site is to be evacuated. Seems like a lot of precautions and safety measures for an old piece of bone. Surely a harmless deer skull could never be that dangerous, right? <gasps> Wrong. You might be forgiven for thinking that a skull can't possibly cause harm. After all, SCP-323 is just a skull, then whatever animal it belonged to is dead. But this skull is far more than it appears to be. Through extensive testing, the SCP Foundation's researchers have learned that the skull isn't dead. No, this skull is awake and aware. It can see, hear, and has a sense of touch, and it can and will react to various stimuli. However, this does not necessarily mean that SCP-323 is alive or even sentient, but it definitely appears to have some level of sapience. It will target certain members of personnel that get too close, and has attempted multiple times to breach containment. It also reacts violently to anyone speaking English or French near it the only two languages prohibited inside SCP-323's cell. So while the skull is not technically alive, it is definitely aware. Still, why the need for so many protocols to keep it contained? It's not as if a skull can just walk off on its own. Of course not. But SCP-323 can move, at least to a certain degree. Often in a reactionary manner, SCP-323 will vibrate or move on its own, for example, turning to watch as personnel enter its containment cell. In most cases, these movements are tiny and insignificant, but other times the skull lunges, launching itself at Foundation personnel as it desperately tries to get free. Now you know why it's kept restrained. So, we have an antlered cervid skull that can move and has a low level of awareness. On their own, these would be more than enough to warrant the Foundation's interest, but the anomalous properties of SCP-323 don't stop there. The skull has an inherent ability to influence the minds of those around it. Anyone spending an hour within a 15-meter radius of SCP-323 is likely to experience the effects of this influential power. This will often result in them exhibiting uncharacteristic behaviors, thoughts, and urges, including cannibalistic tendencies and outbursts of random violence. Almost three-quarters of people that suffer the influence of SCP-323 will feel an overwhelming compulsion to take the Wendigo skull and fit their heads into the chiseled hole on the rear underside. If someone attempting this finds that their head is too big to fit inside the hollow skull, there have been cases of individuals trying to bludgeon their heads on any hard surface they can find nearby in an attempt to get their head down to a more manageable size. This will continue until one of three outcomes occurs. One, the person manages to fit their head into the skull. Two, they cause themselves so much cranial damage that they are rendered unconscious. Or three, they end up killing themselves through repeated violent head trauma. Of course, if a person actually manages to fit their head inside SCP-323, then that is a different story entirely. In these instances, the individual becomes classified as an instance of SCP-323-1. Within 10 minutes of wearing the skull, this person will suffer dramatic changes to their body. Any and all body fat will be rapidly shed as their hair also begins to fall out, leaving them looking starved and almost skeletal in appearance. Their distal phalanges, those are the bones at the tip of the fingers, will elongate and rupture the skin as they become bony, claw-like appendages. The subject will also find that their teeth have grown abnormally long and sharp, 
while their limbs will blacken as if they were suffering frostbite symptoms. Along with their external transformations, SCP-323-1 will also get increased strength and heightened resistance to pain. They aren't invulnerable, though, and can still sustain damage and injuries. SCP-323 will also have a dramatic change happen to their metabolism which will occur a few minutes into the physical transformation. The subject will now need an almost constant intake of calories, which, if they don't receive, will cause them to starve almost instantly. With the transformation process complete, the new instance of SCP-323-1 has finally become the Wendigo, a terrifying monster with one goal to feed. The SCP-323 instance will seek out any human beings it can find so that it can feed upon their flesh. Those who have witnessed the 323 instance in the midst of a feeding frenzy have described the way it violently slaughtered any person it could find, leaving only a mess of blood as it devoured them their screams mixed in with the sounds of bones crunching. In the times that the creature cannot find a human to nourish its monstrous appetite, it will try to keep itself alive any way it can. Sometimes it will slow down its movement to try and conserve energy. Other times it will ration whatever food is available to it saving some of its last meal for a leftover snack. And on occasion, the monster will engage in auto-cannibalism, a form of cannibalism that involves eating parts of itself. Humans certainly seem to be its preferred food source, though. Even when other sources of meat would be easier to acquire, SCP-323-1 will zero in on human beings and will do anything it can to make a person its next meal. When chasing down its prey, human or otherwise, SCP-323-1 has been observed uttering phrases either spoken in the primary language of whoever was transformed by the skull, or in the Severn, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Cree languages. These are all native languages of the numerous indigenous creatures that shared legends of the Wendigo. Where do the phrases come from, though? Are they another side effect of SCP-323's influence? Or do they originate from the skull itself? The Foundation's researchers are still trying to figure that out, and at the moment, they have no clues as to where they come from. In one containment breach in 2006, during which an instance of SCP-323-1 was able to kill and devour 12 members of Foundation personnel, on-site surveillance recorded audio of the creature speaking. It rasped, while dragging a body behind it. After this, the sound of a wet cracking noise was recorded, possibly one of the victim's bones being broken by SCP-323-1 so it could get to the marrow inside. The 323-1 instance does at times seem to try and resist the influence of the Wendigo skull. Additional recordings capture the creature saying, The creature then said, followed by noises of it eating the body. It seems that even the Wendigo has its own internal struggles, perhaps showing that there is still something left of the human who put on the skull, and that deep down they are fighting against their cannibalistic impulses. But where exactly did the Foundation find SCP-323? And is it really the skull of an actual Wendigo? the famous creature from North American legend. In 1997, the SCP Foundation sent a detachment to Bitterin Lake in Saskatchewan, Canada. There had been reports of a local community murdering individuals and leaving their bodies in the forest to appease a dangerous creature residing nearby. This creature, as it was later discovered, was an instance of SCP-323-1. Someone had found the skull and succumbed to its influence placing it on their head and turning into a monster. 
Ever since, the locals had been killing people and offering up their dead bodies as sustenance, fearful of what would happen if they didn't after being brought up with legends of the Wendigo. SCP Foundation agents were able to capture the beast, however it died of starvation while being transported back to containment. They also covered up the recent deaths in the area by giving the local residents amnestics and creating a cover story about an unidentified serial killer. Prior to this, James Namagoose, a local man who was involved in the murders, was brought in for questioning. He remained oddly calm when interviewed, but admitted he had helped move the bodies that were being offered up as food for SCP-323-1, or as he called it, the Wendigo. According to James, a local story among the Cree people told of men who had once tried to control a Wendigo, and perhaps even tame it through offerings of food. Whether or not James and his fellow locals had the same intention, their primary concern was keeping themselves safe. He described first encountering the creature, a warped man walking out of the woods, killed our friends right in front of us. Sometimes it would stare more than it would make to kill, try to talk to you. It whispered at me, Pemisto, come and eat. It made me cold in my bones. As the interview continued, James claimed that he felt like he understood this warped man. He described feeling like the Wendigo was encouraging him to kill, that the creature would help him pass when his own time came. James told the Foundation doctor questioning him that he had heard the creature in his mind, and he felt it watching him almost constantly. Mr. Namagu stated that he hoped in killing people as offerings to the Wendigo, that his own family would be spared. Like the other locals, James Namagoose was given amnestics to forget all about the creature and the murders he'd played a part in committing. So far, none of the Foundation's staff had experienced any similar behavioral effects to those James described. Those who work closely with SCP-323 or have witnessed an instance of SCP-323-1 have felt the creature communicating with them, or urging them to kill on its behalf. Ultimately, who is to say if SCP-323 is the skull of a Wendigo like those from Legend? It certainly seems like it is, but with no way to tell exactly how old the skull is, perhaps it's actually the reverse, and it was the Wendigo legend that spawned from instances of SCP-323-1 that were first encountered by indigenous North American cultures hundreds of years ago. One thing is for certain, if you ever come across a skull with tall antlers, you should try to resist putting it on. Otherwise, you might not be feeling like yourself for much longer. Climbers attempting to summit Mount Everest and stand on the top of the world have their work cut out for them. Dangers are everywhere on the long climb. There's a risk of extreme altitude sickness, unpredictable winds, and freezing weather. There's also the threat of avalanches, great unstoppable tidal waves of snow that can bury a person alive in seconds or strand them leaving them to freeze to death cold and alone. It's a sad reality that not everyone that visits Everest comes back down again, and rarely does a climbing season go by that the mountain doesn't claim yet another victim. Situated on the border between China and Nepal, in a sub-range of the Himalayas of Tibet, Everest is one of the seven wonders of the natural world. With an elevation of 29,031 feet, or 8,848 meters, Mount Everest has attracted many experienced mountain climbers over the decades. But even for the most experienced mountaineers, the ascension up its snowy slopes is far from easy. Deaths occurring on Mount Everest are nothing new, and hundreds of people are believed to have died attempting to ascend the treacherous peak. Sadly, due to the risks involved with carrying heavy loads down off the mountain, Many of those who die on Everest are doomed to stay there forever, their frozen bodies serving up as their own grave markers. It's difficult enough to move your own body up and down Everest, and in many situations, bringing a body back down is simply impossible. The bodies of these lost souls are scattered all across and sometimes underneath the surface of Mount Everest. But some of those bodies are different from the others, and have a special name within the files of the SCP Foundation. They call them SCP-5140. SCP-5140 is the designation given to a number of frozen bodies which are found all across Everest. It is unclear exactly how many instances of SCP-5140 there are, though some estimates have placed the number at somewhere between 1 and 200. At present, it is unknown if all the instances of SCP-5140 are dead bodies belonging to climbers who met tragedy on the tallest mountain in the world, or if some of them are something else entirely. But while their origin is unclear, 
If you come into contact with a 5140 instance, there won't be any doubt that it's different from the normal body of a dead climber. That's because SCP-5140 corpses are a lot like vampires in some ways. That isn't to say that they actually are vampires. They certainly are not undead and cannot function after death. But much like a vampire traditionally drains blood to survive, these bodies drain heat. SCP-5140 corpses are ectoentropic, meaning they do not adhere to the normal laws of thermodynamics. Whenever these cadavers are exposed to sources of heat, including human body heat, the corpse will instantly drain the source of any and all thermal energy. However, the temperature of these SCP-5140 bodies remains the same, regardless of how much heat they are able to drain, staying at a constant 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or 10 degrees Celsius. Should any living person come into direct contact with one of the SCP-5140 corpses, the body will absorb their natural body heat, bringing their victim's own temperature down to 10 degrees Celsius and causing them to die. And once they have died, their body then becomes a new instance of SCP-5140. As a quick side note, this might feel vaguely reminiscent of another anomaly, which features seemingly inert dead bodies that are hazardous to anyone around them. SCP-2316 This anomaly is a powerful mimetic hazard consisting of a large number of drowned human corpses. These corpses are extremely hazardous to approach at even a considerable distance, as the mimetic hazard inherent to the anomaly causes those affected to recognize the bodies in the water as people they know, particularly from their childhood. Like a siren's call, the victims are lured into the water, believing that the familiar bodies are calling to them. If the victims aren't stopped, quarantined, and given amnestic treatment, they are essentially considered lost. They will walk into the water and be absorbed into the collective, becoming just another body floating in the water. While the Foundation doesn't currently believe that there is any official connection between the two anomalies, the similarities are undeniable and worth taking into consideration. Moving on. At present, it is unclear whether SCP-5140 corpses are caused by some sort of infection or parasite that spreads among the bodies uncovered at Mount Everest. If this is the case, the Foundation has yet to uncover the Patient Zero, the root cause of these infected bodies. There is also little to determine why a deceased body requires the absorption of heat, as well as how it achieves this and also keeps its own temperature low but not frozen. Given that interacting with an instance of SCP-5140 can be fatal, it does seem that these anomalous properties can be passed through contact and exposure, like a disease or a parasite. But there have been no observed anomalous effects among any living person visiting Mount Everest. There is a possibility that the SCP-5140 corpses have developed some form of posthumous mutation that has come as a result of being killed during an Everest avalanche and buried in the snow their bodies starved of heat after death. After all, Everest is known for its cold temperatures, occasionally reaching as low as 1 degree Fahrenheit or minus 17 degrees Celsius. Not to mention the difference in air pressure at such high altitudes, as well as frequent high-speed freezing cold winds. At the summit of Mount Everest, wind speeds can reach up to 280 kilometers per hour. That is equivalent to 175 miles per hour and high-speed winds have even been known to catch mountain climbers off guard and send them plummeting to their deaths. Perhaps the combination of these conditions, the freezing temperature, the air pressure, and the winds have triggered some sort of change in a number of the bodies unfortunate enough to never leave the snow-covered slopes of Mount Everest. Either that, or these abandoned corpses left in such extreme cold could be the perfect home. Maybe some form of unknown and so far undetected parasite is capable of inhabiting these frozen bodies, and can spread to other living hosts by draining them of their body heat. Stranger things have certainly happened at the SCP Foundation, and that could possibly explain why anyone interacting with an SCP-5140 corpse meets the same grisly fate. Regardless of what causes these abnormalities, or why the SCP-5140 bodies have only been uncovered at Mount Everest, Close contact with the corpses often result in casualties and fatalities. Naturally, this is a cost the SCP Foundation likes to avoid as often as it can. The nasty habit SCP-5140 corpses have of draining a person's body heat makes it impractical to bring them back to a Foundation research facility for testing, as does the fact that they're on the tallest mountain in the world. 
Instead, MTF Delta 14 have been tasked with keeping these heat-thirsty cadavers contained to Mount Everest. Mobile Task Force Delta 14, also known under the codename Winter Wonderland, is formed of a group of particularly adept mountaineers, and experts in understanding and adapting to particularly brutal terrain without drawing attention to themselves. These covert operatives are tasked with periodically climbing Mount Everest and keeping SCP-5140 contained. It is this team's job to locate any new instance of SCP-5140 bodies and bury them in the snow. In doing so, the goal is to prevent any unwitting mountain climbers from stumbling upon one of these bodies and potentially becoming a new instance themselves. Meanwhile, the Foundation is pushing for both Nepal and Tibet to tighten restrictions on climbing permits. But of course, the money that Mount Everest tourism brings to these two countries has likely impeded this. According to the Foundation's file on SCP-5140, an incident occurred during one of Mobile Task Force Delta 14's annual Everest expeditions. Members of MTF Delta 14 had been traversing towards the Everest summit, encountering more and more of the SCP-5140 bodies as they made their way up the mountain. Just as they were instructed to do so, the team buried each of the frozen corpses they came across under a blanket of snow. The Delta 14s noticed, though, that there had been a much higher number of the frosty cadavers on this mission speculating that perhaps Mount Everest's high winds had blown the snow off of ones they had already buried on previous missions. One of the Delta 14s, a man named Charlie Smith, was in correspondence with his colleagues at their base camp. Charlie reported that one of his fellow Winter Wonderlanders, Patrick, had touched one of the SCP-5140 corpses when the team reached the summit, and that he was now buried according to protocols after becoming an SCP-5140 instance himself. As they began their descent from atop Everest, Charlie sent an urgent communication to base camp, reporting that he'd uncovered three more SCP-5140 bodies at an abandoned campsite. Except these three instances were different from any he had encountered before. These corpses were somehow still moving. Attempting to hurry down the mountain, Charlie reported that a mass of SCP-5140 corpses were blocking his path and draining another one of his squad mates, Arnold, of his body heat to make him one of them. Arnold had been carrying the team's provisions, including their oxygen reserves to combat the lack of breathable air at Mount Everest's high altitude. Charlie tried in vain to use his flare gun to clear the path, hoping to distract the now walking cadavers with a heat source, but it had no effect. His final message to base camp warned the rest of Delta 14 to not come to the summit of Everest, with Charlie frantically urging them to not let climbers anywhere near it. His final message simply stated that, the mountain is danger. A rescue division of Mobile Task Force Delta 14 arrived just under two hours later, tracking Charlie's last known location via a GPS beacon. Strangely, despite the frantic messages from Charlie, there were no signs of any SCP-5140 instances. None of the piles of corpses he had warned them about could be seen above the snow, and certainly none of them were moving. It wasn't long before the rescue team found Charlie, though. He was dead, but not drained of heat or turned into another instance of SCP-5140. No, sadly, after bringing their fallen comrade back to base, an autopsy revealed that Charlie had died likely the same way so many other climbers on Everest had. He had suffered from a lack of oxygen. Further examination of his gear revealed that Charlie's oxygen intake valve had been damaged earlier while the squad had been climbing to the summit of Mount Everest. His teammates Arnold Hillary and Patrick Edmund were also discovered on the mountain, but only Patrick had been turned into an SCP-5140 instance. Arnold had simply died from exposure, just like Charlie. The rescue team concluded that due to lack of adequate oxygen, Charlie Smith had hallucinated the sight of SCP-5140 corpses moving and blocking his path, spending his final moments in terror as the mountain's conditions slowly killed him. The Foundation is still unsure exactly what causes bodies to become instances of SCP-5140, or even how many of them are on Everest, but a major and troubling development has recently been made. After an increase in global temperature led to a large avalanche that resulted in a large portion of the mountain that had previously been covered in thick snow being exposed, the Foundation sent planes that were equipped with thermal imaging equipment to scan the mountain. What they found was as confusing as it was terrifying. The SCP-5140 corpses aren't just spread across the surface of Mount Everest. They are much of Everest. The mountain itself is just a huge pile of corpses, just waiting to drain the life from anyone who attempts to scale it and turn them into a permanent part of the peak. So if you were planning a trip to the Himalayas, 
hoping to scratch Climb Mount Everest off your bucket list, maybe give it a pass. Otherwise, you might find that the climb is even colder than you were expecting. The SCP Foundation works very hard to keep all the knowledge and evidence of their discoveries from reaching the outside world. As far as the average person is concerned, the entities and anomalies documented by the SCP Foundation do not exist. Anyone that stumbles upon an anomaly without authorization will wind up having their memory wiped with amnestics or something far, far worse. But either way, the knowledge never enters into the general public's consciousness. But what if there was an anomaly that even the members of the Foundation didn't know about? Not because they hadn't discovered it yet, but because somehow it wouldn't let itself be known. It sounds impossible, but one particular Foundation researcher faced this paradox while covering an anomaly that is currently listed in the archives without a number, referred only as Knife. Junior researcher Harris was assigned to SCP-4955 one day and given the responsibility of examining it and cataloging any anomalous behavior displayed by the item. SCP-4955 was a simple knife of unknown make and model, about the size and sharpness of a common kitchen knife. He took the knife into the lab and ran the usual tests. He scanned the materials, tested for any kind of radiation, administered thermodynamic tests, and did everything else that is standard procedure for a new SCP. In spite of all of his efforts, he found nothing unusual about it at all. It was just a knife, with a metal blade and a wooden handle. It didn't give off radiation. It didn't have any unusual level of sharpness. It didn't glow in the dark. By all accounts, it was a completely ordinary, boring knife. So why, then, was it even at the Foundation in the first place? Why was his time, which could be better spent on other more pressing research, being wasted here? Junior researcher Harris decided to present his highly uneventful report to his supervisor. It was then, finally, that the strangeness began. At the start of the meeting, Harris's supervisor had no memory of anything being placed in P0055, where the knife was being stored. Harris confirmed that, yes, there was something there. He continued his report, explaining that the knife had displayed no anomalous properties at all and didn't seem like the sort of thing the Foundation should be wasting resources on. As soon as he delivered his report, his supervisor just stared at him, blankly, as if she was expecting something from him. Unsettled, Harris asked her if she was alright. She replied sharply, saying that she was perfectly fine, but was getting tired of waiting for him to give his report. Caught completely off guard, Harris gave her his report on the knife a second time, only to be met with the same blank stare. He attempted to give the report two more times before giving up and leaving in exasperation. Somehow, as soon as he told his supervisor about the knife, she forgot everything he said on the subject. Determined to explore this bizarre turn of events further, Harris set about recruiting a colleague to help him conduct an experiment with the knife. He managed to bribe another Foundation employee named Researcher Smalls with $5 and the appeal of an unsolved mystery and he agreed to step in and participate. As soon as Smalls entered the room where the research was being conducted, Harris held up the knife and showed it to him. He asked Smalls, Do you see this? To which Smalls replied bafflingly, See what? Harris approached Smalls, holding the knife right up to his face. Still, Smalls insisted that he saw nothing in the room aside from Harris and himself. The more Harris pressed him, the more Smalls insisted with a smile that he did not see the knife and had no idea what Harris was talking about. In a frustrated outburst, Harris smacked Smalls across the face with the broad side of the knife. He stumbled for a moment as the blow made its impact, then steadied himself and looked at Harris with the same expression as before, the same expression he had seen on his supervisor earlier that same day. Attempting to regain his composure, Harris asked Smalls, Did you feel that? Smalls grinned at him and replied, All I feel is bored. Determined to push the limits of his colleague's apparent forgetfulness, Harris cornered Smalls and raised the knife to his face once more. This time, slowly, maintaining eye contact with him all the while, Harris used the blade to make a deliberate, shallow cut across Smalls' cheek. The man winced as the knife made its mark. But as soon as the blade was tucked into Harris's pocket and out of sight, he did not reference it once. He smirked at Harris with blood dripping down his cheek from a wound he would not acknowledge. This experiment with Smalls brought Harris's understanding of the knife into sharp perspective. The knife itself was not the anomaly, but rather the knife's effect on anyone who observed it. 
Everyone, with the inexplicable exception of Harris, who observed or learned about the knife, was rendered somehow unable to verbally acknowledge or possibly even comprehend its existence. Harris and Smalls met for dinner later that evening, and Harris was fascinated to see that his colleague's cheek was still smeared with blood. It had been left to dry there all day, undisturbed on Smalls' face. Several other researchers noticed the wound and asked Smalls about it, who insisted it was nothing. The curious parties accepted his answer, but only after looking at Harris for a long time. Though they would not say it out loud, on some level they knew what had happened with the knife. When Smalls wasn't looking, Harris dosed his drink with a strong memory recovery agent developed by the Foundation's anti-memetics team and attempted to introduce Smalls to the knife again. Unfortunately, it had no effect, and Smalls was still unable to acknowledge the existence of the knife. The next day, determined to take his experimentation to the next level, Harris cut his own cheek with the knife. He walked around the facility as usual, letting his wound bleed freely onto his face and formerly pristine white lab coat. Colleagues stopped him to ask what had happened, and he told them plainly, I cut myself with SCP-4955. Upon hearing those words, each person asking about Harris's injury immediately turned and walked away, covering their mouth. Believing the knife to be some kind of anti-meme, or an anomaly that resists being recorded or remembered, Harris administered further tests. He ran the knife through a QNTM anti-meme machine, but found nothing. The knife behaved like previous anti-memes, but was unaffected by machinery designed to observe them, and was immune to the effects of memory recovery agents designed to counter them. What then was it? Harris was beginning to feel like he was at the center of a grand practical joke, and he couldn't figure out the punchline. All he knew was that his grip on reality was beginning to slip, and the knife was to blame. Harris's supervisor stopped by his office to check in with him about SCP-4955, demanding a report on the anomaly. At the end of his rope, he responded, What 4955? Just as the supervisor began to reprimand him for his poor attitude, Harris took the paperwork for 4955 and shredded it into ribbons with a knife as his supervisor watched. As soon as he was finished, he looked up to see his supervisor staring at him, wide-eyed. Slowly, she lifted her hand to her mouth and began to laugh. She laughed loudly, uproariously, like it was the best joke she had ever heard. Then she asked him to take a look at SCP-3309 instead. Harris clenched his jaw, glared at her, and lifted the knife to his hand. He sliced open the tip of his finger and flicked the blood onto her face. She didn't even flinch. Instead, she turned away laughing, face still streaked with Harris's blood, and went about the rest of her day. This is the moment when Harris began to crack. All he wanted was for someone, anyone, to acknowledge the knife that was driving him out of his mind. It was as if the entire facility, including his own machinery, was gaslighting him. He decided to take more extreme measures to get everybody's attention. At this point, whatever it took, he would do it. Harris marched into the Foundation's cafeteria at lunchtime, carrying his usual bag. He walked into the center of the room, taking in the sight of his colleagues. His supervisor still had his blood on her face. Smalls still had a pool of dried blood on his cheek from his day-old wound. Harris took a deep breath and unzipped his bag, pulling out a test rat from one of the laboratories. As the crowded cafeteria looked on, Harris pulled the knife from his pocket and dispatched the rat with one quick slash. He held the dead rat up in the air, commanding the attention of the room, then let it drop with a sickening thud. No one said a word. They only watched and quietly laughed amongst themselves. Five days later, the rat was still there. It had been stepped on and flattened by days of foot traffic. Flies were beginning to buzz around the corpse and the smell had seeped into the ceiling and walls. Still, no one mentioned or referenced it. No one moved it. And no one talked about the knife. The following day, unable to stand the smell or the sight of it anymore, Harris broke down and cleaned up the rat. As he did, he could hear people laughing behind him. Every time Harris entered a room, people were laughing about something, and no one would tell him what. Still, when he brought up the knife, even when he screamed and cried and pleaded, everyone ignored the subject. It would not, and could not, be spoken about. Several days later, Smalls complained that someone had cut the plants he was growing in his room. Even though Harris had not cut his plants, he decided to take credit. I did it, with my knife, he said. As soon as the knife was mentioned, Small sat down and went completely silent, abandoning the subject entirely. 
This gave Harris another crucial piece of information on the nature of the knife's effects. It did not matter whether the knife was actually present or involved in something. All that mattered was the perception that it was. Even the mention of the knife was enough to invoke its effect. The days bled into each other. Day after day of Harris begging his colleagues to see what he saw, demanding to know what the hell they were laughing about, and feeling more and more utterly alone. Harris's mind had truly begun to come apart at the seams. In the second to last entry in his research log, he simply wrote, It's almost showtime. Time to give the people what they want. The day after he wrote that cryptic entry, Harris walked up to Smalls in the cafeteria and tapped him on the shoulder. When Smalls turned to greet his friend, Harris stabbed him in the chest. Smalls fell to the ground, curling up in the fetal position, and Harris kicked the knife deeper in as Smalls cowered there. He did not stop until Smalls was dead. Harris was removed from the facility, leaving the knife in Smalls' body. Harris was promptly terminated, eliminating the last person who appeared was able to discuss the knife. As for the knife now, its current location is unknown, making this mundane little object one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the SCP Foundation. What was the knife exactly? What gave it such a strange hold on people? In the end, it might not even matter. After all, what is more frightening? An object that prevents people from being able to remember it, or being the only person in the whole world who does. An organization with as many secrets as the SCP Foundation requires the ability to dispose of material that could prove harmful to the facade of normalcy that the O5 Council desperately wishes to uphold. And because most of the high-ranking researchers are a bit too smart and practical to simply flush classified documents and unwanted objects down the toilet, that means the Foundation has to get rid of evidence thorough enough to guarantee that absolutely no trace of what needs to be disposed of survives. For this purpose, several waste disposal plants are used as front companies for the Foundation and function internally as a foolproof way to liquidate hazardous material and comprising information. But not all secrets are so easily forgotten with the push of a button and a rare few can prove too resilient to be burned away. This is the regrettable case of the anomalies contained within the site now designated SCP-2419, a place where the unfortunate consequence of amnestic experiments has led to the creation of hateful, immortal humanoids, fated to be sealed within the incinerators of the facility. These undead freaks are known as SCP-2419-A, and though they were made from human bodies, the consciousness that dwells within each instance is nothing short of pure evil. Every happy memory and associated positive emotion was extracted from the brains of SCP-2419-A corpses prior to their attempted disposal in the incinerators. This was done in order to increase the effectiveness of standard-issue Foundation amnestics. But the cost of this minor breakthrough was that these bodies, all of which were once D-Class personnel, had effectively been stripped of all human qualities. Given the sorts of violent criminal backgrounds that earns an individual the designation of D-Class personnel, these former humans were the last people that should have been deprived of the love and joy in their hearts. And when the first of these psychopathic laughing men crawled out of one of SCP-2419's incinerators, the Foundation learned all too well what an uninhibited criminal mind looked like. Driven only by rage and fury that inspired their most gruesome acts of exploitation and violence in life, their pain has made them too hateful to succumb to the flames. They are the archetypal sinners of a burning hell that the Foundation's best intentions pave the road to. And when they break loose, all that hell breaks loose with them. But no place of the damned leaves its gates unguarded. Dante's Inferno posits that the ancient Greek mythological figure Minos, serpentine father of the Minotaur and judge of wicked souls, guards the pit of hell with stern vigilance. The Greeks themselves favored the image of Cerberus, a three-headed hound that served its lord Hades as a watchdog. For the ancient Egyptians, there was Amut, the devourer of the dead, who consumed the hearts of the unrighteous in the afterlife. While this sort of guardian beast is not officially on the Foundation's payroll, 
The concept turned out to be alive and well in the present day when SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, stood against the laughing men and gave them the fight of their tortured, unliving existence. It all began when the guards stationed at SCP-2419 began to hear banging from inside one of the incinerators. It seemed as though the SCP-2419-A instance on the other side was determined to breach containment. So Mobile Task Force Beta-7, the Maz Hatters, were called in to stand with all weapons at the ready. But this was exactly what the instance wanted. As soon as the armed force had fully assembled, the laughing man inside ripped the door from its hinges. It proceeded to use it as a cover and run full speed towards the Mobile Task Force, who opened fire immediately. SCP-2419-A were known to possess extremely fast regenerative abilities, so it would take a lot of punishment to slow this instance down. But this was no unthinking zombie, and the instance broke its charge the second it was in the midst of the mobile task force agents to twirl the door around like a trained martial artist. This not only sent the incoming bullets ricocheting everywhere, causing many of the Beta-7 operatives to be hit by their own friendly fire, it also allowed the instance to bludgeon several agents with sides of the door. As the remaining mobile task force members retreated to a less exposed vantage point, where they could employ heavy artillery, the instance used this moment of confusion to pitch the door backwards towards the incinerators in a boomerang trajectory. The force and spin of the door knocked two more incinerator doors off their hinges, and caused two other instances of SCP-2419-A to emerge. One, who was so thoroughly decomposed that it appeared to be more than a flaming skeleton, sprinted forth and threw handfuls of hot cinders at the Foundation agents. It used its still-burning body to ignite a few of the closest agents, laughing with sadistic glee as it did so. Seconds after the emergence of the two new instances, a grenade launcher was fired at the first escapee. The blast was enough to deal significant damage, but the instance was indifferent to its own pain. It pointed to the agent wielding the grenade launcher, and a moment later, the third instance was at the agent's throat, strangling him to death. It was starting to become clear to the mobile task force that this was no random containment breach. It was a coordinated escape attempt by three ruthless criminal masterminds, who in their time contained at the site SCP-2419 had probably decided there was some truth to the old adage that misery loves company. And indeed, these three D-Class were some of the best of the best when it came to being the worst of the worst. D-1576, formerly Police Lieutenant Campbell Farage, a riot cop with a serious taste for carnage. Whenever the streets of the city precinct he presided over turned violent, Farage always made sure that the violence didn't die down too quickly. His nasty penchant for bludgeoning suspects and citizens alike with his riot shield did wonders for the escape plan he had coordinated with his fellow laughing men. He was eventually tried and sent to a supermax after picking a fight with several other officers in the line of duty. A fight that resulted in a pair of rookie officers who opposed his violent methods being hospitalized with permanent comas. The skeleton was D-4483, Damien Lambert, a prolific arsonist who terrorized three counties while avoiding detection under the guise of being a sovereign citizen. If there was ever a person who wanted just to watch the world burn, it was Damien Lambert. He was caught in the process of setting fire to an elementary school and was thankfully apprehended before any of the kerosene he had poured through the halls ignited. When the truth about his previous history of pyromania came out, Lambert faced death row until the Foundation chose to recruit him as D-Class. Then there was D-2316, Arnold Roper, who was better known as the Illinois Strangler, responsible for over 50 deaths in two decades before he was arrested and detained. While he mostly used his bare hands to do the deed, Roper was fond of using metal chains and heavy-duty choke collars, usually worn by animals to perform his namesake act of violence. Roper wasn't just brutally strong, he was crafty too, and the trio of laughing men had him to thank for some of the finer points of the escape plan. The three now immortal D-Class also had one thing in common. Each of them had met the ends of their cruel and violent lives at the jaws and claws of SCP-682, and now that they had outmaneuvered and slaughtered Mobile Task Force Beta-7, 
their only collective goal was to get revenge on the monster that condemned them all to the fiery hell of the incinerator. The Laughing Man soon breached the limits of the SCP-2419 containment site and began making their way overland towards the facility where all of them had met their original fate. They knew they needed wheels to get there, so the instances made their way to the nearest gas station from the waste disposal plant they'd come from and made short work of the staff. Lambert stocked up on lighters, kerosene, and duraflame, while Farage took the emergency shotgun that the cashier hadn't had time to fire. In her defense, it would have been difficult to accomplish much of anything with Roper's hands clasped around her throat. Once the trio of undead psychopaths had stocked up on weapons, they waited for a suitable vehicle to pull into the lot. And before long, there was. A family SUV, with a happy family inside, no less. Farage ordered Lambert to keep his fire-starting tendencies in check, as a gas station explosion was the last thing they needed right now. The former riot cop made his way out to the car and used the shotgun to threaten the family out of the car. Family road trips can be stressful, but rarely does one expect to be carjacked by a gang of the undead. Farage told the unlucky mortals that he wouldn't hurt them if they let himself and his two friends use their car. And true to his word, he didn't fire a single shot. The family were all added to Roper's list of victims instead. After that, the three men took to the wheel, and with only their hazy memories of pain and suffering to guide them, drove relentlessly towards the Foundation facility, where their enemy SCP-682 was contained. The three had made sure to leave no human alive at their original containment site, and would allow no witnesses who saw their anomalous corpse-like forms to survive. They couldn't afford to give the Foundation a heads up that the reckoning was on its way in a family motor vehicle. Meanwhile, at the Laughing Man's intended destination, SCP-682 was having another perfectly routine day of painfully soaking in a tank of corrosive acid. This was par for the course for the reptile, and it found itself as eager as anyone else stuck in a rut to get a break from the repetitive mundanity of containment. Little did the human-hating monster know, it would soon get its wish. A few hours later, the facility was shocked to find that several fires had been lit at the fringes of the testing units. These were no freak accidents, but rather the work of Damien Lambert. The arsonist still had memories of all the times he wished he could just burn his jailer's buildings to the ground and had targeted the most vulnerable areas for combustion. The flames threatened the integrity of several areas of the facility, and multiple containment breaches were imminent if the blaze couldn't be kept under control. While any available agents with firefighting experience sought to minimize the damage, the researchers evacuated to safer parts of the building, bringing any sensitive documents and flammable items far away from the affected sections. This kind of pandemonium was exactly where Officer Farage thrived, and he soon entered the fray, causing enough commotion that Roper was able to slip deeper into the facility completely undetected. This turned out to be the perfect role for the Strangler, as he hadn't eluded the police for 20 years of his life just by being lucky. Farage and Lambert would both join up with him after they were finished having their fun. For now, his task was to locate the containment unit of SCP-682 and give the beast a taste of what the trio had in store. Along the way, he made sure to obtain some durable metal chains from a different containment unit. He likely released some kind of elder evil in the process, but Roper didn't care about the consequences. The bottom line was that he was always able to do his best work when he was armed. It wasn't long before he found the large chamber which housed his most hated foe, SCP-682. Roper laughed maniacally as he approached the creature floating in its acid tank. Remember me, lizard? The strangler said, sporting a wide grin. The monster simply growled back at Roper, wishing to tear him apart. Roper chuckled again and wrapped the iron chains around the vat. With all the considerable strength of his immortal muscles, the strangler pulled the chains taut and shattered 682's containment unit. The anomalous chain snared the creature's body, holding it in place. How about now? Roper taunted 682. He laughed, but the creature laughed back. No, said the reptile. I don't remember you, but you are disgusting. The monster lunged towards a nearby wall and burst through, dragging Roper along with it by his chain still wrapped around the creature's body. 682 twisted and turned, flinging Roper against every wall and obstacle in sight. 
but to its surprise, the stranger was regenerating, and his grip on the chains was unyielding. Back down the hall, Farage was still continuing his rampage when he ran into an unlikely adversary. Dr. Alto Clef stood between the laughing man and the other researchers, and as usual, the good doctor was packing heat. He told the other researchers to go on without him, while he contained the SCP-2419 instance on his own. A bold move, to be sure, but Dr. Clef had made the same mistake he was always making, by assuming that guns were the solution to this problem. Farage laughed off the bullets and slammed into Dr. Clef with enough force to leave a crater in the wall behind him. He followed up with a merciless barrage of punches, beating the armed researchers senseless, and only relenting for a moment to steal a few of his prized firearms. With a blow that would have taken the life of any normal man, Farage struck Dr. Clef once more and left him lying there a hair's length from death. Dr. Clef's anti-anomaly field may have protected him from reality warpers, but it did very little against being kicked repeatedly, very hard, in the face. Elsewhere, Lambert had made his way into the facility, setting more fires as he went. The arsonist's skeleton was a terrifying sight to all that beheld it, and when the guards realized that none of their weapons would have any effect, most of them started to run away from Lambert rather than towards him. All three laughing men would soon be upon 682, and then the fight of their afterlives could truly begin. Until that moment, Roper was buying his partners in hatred more time. The chains he had stolen were no ordinary metal, and with them he had managed to keep 682's jaws shut while he pounded away at its exposed ribs with his inhuman strength. Roper had killed more people than either of his former D-Class compatriots, but all that seemed to mean nothing in the face of this invincible reptile. The shame and powerlessness he had once felt as the creature had mauled him to death made his immortal heart beat with outrage. When he was alive, the Illinois stranger had always thought that his gift for murder made him better than the average person, a man among men. But this thing had made him feel weak in his last moments of humanity, and that sickening emotion of weakness was still sliding around in his soul with all of the other despair and malice. If his fate were to live forever as a dead man walking, then he would make damn sure that any humiliation he suffered would be paid back threefold. This soup of impotent fury bubbled within Roper as SCP-682 strength suddenly increased, shattering the weak link of the chains and sending the hapless strangler flying backwards. At that precise moment, Farage leaped out of a nearby hallway and unleashed Dr. Clef's arsenal on the reptile. This sustained fire irritated the creature, and it turned its focus towards the unliving dirty cop. It readied a charge only to be suddenly held fast by Roper, who had grabbed its tail. Farage fired until there was no more ammo, then pistol whipped the creature in both of its eye sockets. SCP-682 thrashed and struggled, so the men began to circle the reptile and alternate delivering formidable body blows. They took far more damage than they could dish out with their bare hands, but the regeneration that their preternatural hatred granted them meant that both instances could theoretically keep this up all day. Roper grabbed a broken length of the anomalous chain, while Farage picked up a metal table to use as a makeshift riot shield. The beatdown continued as 682's eyes regenerated, along with several new sensory organs to give it a full 360-degree view of the pitched brawl that was taking place. A fiery explosion blew open a nearby wall, and in walked Lambert, still skeletal and laughing as uproariously as ever. He threw a Molotov cocktail at 682's back, causing the creature to ignite immediately. The reptile roared in sudden agony. Farage, Lambert, Roper regrouped at the creature's flank and pushed together until they forced it back through the hole where the arsonist had entered from. They were now all together in the inferno, the three laughing men who refused to die, and the indestructible monster that made them into what they were. Roper quickly knotted the chains and wrapped them around one of the creature's claws, securing the other end around his waist. Like a trained boxer, he bobbed and weaved, pummeling the beast with all he had. Any step back from SCP-682 was met with the immortal man shifting his entire body weight to pull the creature's leg out from under it. Farage wedged his shield into the creature's open jaw, widening it to an uncomfortable degree and temporarily limiting 682's bite force. He took out the shotgun that he had stolen from the gas station and blasted it down the reptile's gullet. 
When that plan had run its course, he started clubbing 682 about its neck and head with the butt of the shotgun. Lambert simply continued to douse the arena with more flammable material, especially himself and the creature. He climbed onto 682's back with his burning bones and hammered away at its defenses with literal fists of fire. The arsonist was incapable of articulate speech due to the damage to his body prior to his death, but if he could speak, he would probably be celebrating the fact that he had become what he had always wanted to be. Damien Lambert was no mere pretender with a fetish for fire. He was fire itself. A brightly burning god of destruction that left no inch of the world unburnt and no molecule of oxygen unconsumed. His mother and father would be proud of him as they waited in hell for the sun who would never arrive. The sun who would make the planet they left behind into a true hell where he would reign supreme. That is, until SCP-682 stole that dream out from under him. With a flash of blue and green from deep within, 682 began to burn with a never-before-seen chemical reaction, an impossible event that could only be described as anti-fire. The turquoise anti-flames devoured the orange and yellow ones, leaving Lambert in a state of panic, which was soon shared by his fellow laughing men. The three former D-classes had gotten so used to the torments of the incinerator that the idea that anything could be more painful had never occurred to them. And yet, here it was, the Anti-Fire, which devoured all flames and directly inflicted unimaginable suffering to the trio of instances. Every particle of their still regenerating bodies felt as if it were ice cold and melting into nothingness at the same time. Numbed and broken all over again, the laughing men were consumed all over by the anti-flames and fell into a state of suspended animation. With the Foundation finally getting everything back under control 24 hours later, SCP-682 was contained in a new acidic chamber. There were some new ordinances from all present and surviving researchers about exposing it to fire, as the anti-flames it produced were considered too hazardous to ever exist within the facility again. As for the three laughing men who had escaped from SCP-2419, they were returned to their containment units inside of the incinerators and never exhibited signs of aggression or escape attempts ever again. A psychological profile of Farage, Lambert, and Roper that all of them could still feel the sting of the burns left by 682's anti-fire to this day, and that not even exposure to natural heat and fire could ever reduce that pain. Sirens blared, and the loud ringing of the emergency alarm system gave everyone a scare like something had jumped out at them unexpectedly. With that fright came a sharp jolt of adrenaline. Something wasn't right, and their options were either to await instructions or try and flee with their lives. Most took the latter, dropping their shovels and various mining tools so they could turn heel and bolt to the nearest opening. Outside, if they could just get outside, above ground where the air was a little clearer, then they could avoid whatever it was that was happening. But for Yuri, escape wasn't an option. He had to do something. It had been a standard operation. Everything had been run by the books and was going all the smoother for it. But that noble approach hadn't stopped the drill from breaching into a cavern, carving through stone into a previously undiscovered area. That, on its own, wasn't enough to cause concern. It was the sudden cave-in that had triggered the alarms and led to the ensuing panic. At the controls of the gigantic excavation machine, Yuri helplessly pulled at levers and pressed buttons, desperately trying to undo the rapidly worsening damage. But it was too late. Rocks and debris were showering from above, like the earth itself was retaliating against the mining workers. It was as if they shouldn't have drilled that deep. The cave in almost like they had awakened something. Unfortunately for Yuri, a falling slab of stone made sure he wouldn't get to see exactly what. The dust settled shortly after, but only one recorded casualty, along with multiple injured mine workers, wasn't enough to deter them from exploring what they had accidentally stumbled upon. Venturing into the cavern system pierced by the drill, those who first dared to set foot down there were greeted by the sight of strange, crudely built stone structures. Someone had been here before, but how? Nothing could survive this far below ground, nothing living, Nothing human, at least. And that was true, given that the workers also came across something else in their initial exploration. Human remains. 
Of course, this raised quite a concern, prompting the workers to try and contact their superiors. Uncovering bodies wasn't exactly uncommon for anyone whose job it was to dig into the ground, so they at least had a protocol in place for this kind of situation. What none of them were prepared for, however, was the fiery abomination that suddenly emerged as they were trying to call for help. The creature was a nightmarish blend of a humanoid shape with the head of a dog and giant wings much like a bat's. Covered in rough fur, its body was exuding an oily, flammable substance, which it used to incinerate the surviving mine workers in an instant. By the time that operatives of the SCP Foundation arrived on scene in the town of Mirni within the Sakha Republic, the creature was on a rampage. Buildings were collapsing as the winged beast set the nearby area ablaze. Troops on the ground, even once they were able to get the monster in range, found that their conventional weapons were useless. It cost the lives of 17 mobile task force operatives, all immolated down to a cinder, before a chopper was able to neutralize the creature. With the threat destroyed and the town administered with amnestics and fed a convincing cover story, you'd think that was case closed on a job well done. But the Foundation discovered within the nearby Mirni mine something that would completely change everything they thought they knew. Deep underground was a sinkhole, leading to a spatial anomaly below, consisting of the system of caverns that the mine workers had inadvertently stumbled upon. That wasn't all that the Foundation was about to discover down there, and what they came across would soon become one of their darkest secrets, SCP-3667. It wasn't long before the Foundation began encountering other unusual creatures that seemingly appeared in the vicinity of SCP-3667. However, not all of them matched the description of the original bat-winged, dog-headed, pyromaniacal visitor, officially dubbed as instances of SCP-3667-1. These creatures range from the aforementioned monstrosity to a whole host of other strange descriptions. One was an abnormally thin humanoid creature with reddish-brown skin and a head that was too big for its wiry body. It possessed an ordinary human level of intelligence and even spoke modern Russian, matching the common local dialect. In conversation, this being tried to offer wealth or power in exchange for a person's most valued possessions. However, it seemed to possess no anomalous abilities and would attempt to renegotiate a new offer immediately after a bargain was made. Then there were the Magistrates, a group of 48 humanoids with kyphotic curved spines. All of them wore furs and a variety of skulls from animals such as elks, deer, and moose. The Foundation were still none the wiser as to the true origin of all these different subspecies of creatures. They were obviously emanating from the sinkhole, and the Foundation had been making use of MTF Chi-5, codenamed Solomon Seals to eliminate instances of SCP-3667-1 that appeared from below. Surface-to-air missile systems were even installed nearby, should any more flying creatures appear. But further exploration into the sinkhole and the caverns below would only yield further questions and even more strange entities. The four-person unit MTF Chi-5 Team-1 was sent in to conduct preliminary exploration into SCP-3667 to try and assess more accurately the threat level posed by the sinkhole and its bizarre residents. Finding themselves in a large cave, the team followed the sounds of running water to a wide stream, the water a yellowish-gray in coloration. They also detected the sound of numerous voices, all whispering in Russian, but found it too difficult to distinguish what they were saying. There were remains, too, of some kind of structure that seemed to indicate the existence of sentient life within SCP-3667. There was a portion of a wall, even a hallway, that led into a large windowless circular room. The floor of this chamber featured an elaborate mosaic that seemed to have sustained some damage. But strangely, it depicted anomalous creatures, including some that looked like the first winged monster that had appeared. After splitting up down various corridors, two members of Team 1 encountered a new entity from within SCP-3667. This creature resembled a large feline, but had no eyes and was about 10 meters in height. It referred to the MTF operatives as sinners and foolish mortals who should have stayed in their cages. Despite being eyeless, the creature observed that the team did not possess what it called the Mark of Ogniena and remarked that they should not have been there. Feeling threatened by the creature, MTF Chi-5 Team 1 was able to blow it up with a grenade before being safely retrieved by their fellow Foundation personnel. 
Exploration into SCP-3667 was then resumed by MTF Chi-5 Teams 2 and 3, who were alarmed to hear what sounded like a human scream coming from somewhere within the caves. While they first assumed it was another 3667-1 creature, someone suggested the possibility that a civilian could have stumbled onto the site of the Myrny Mine before the Foundation had arrived and established a secure perimeter around the sinkhole. Hearing the scream a second time, this time further away, the MTF agents decided to investigate, just in case an innocent person had been dragged underground by one of the creatures. Passing through a basin of the same strange fluid that Team 1 had discovered, the MTF teams could hear more unsettling sounds coming from deep within the caverns, in particular, a repetitive scratching noise. Next, they discovered a large, intricate wooden structure, a circle with one side that appeared to be winched open. Inside, they could see rows of wooden spikes, covered in a dark liquid that everyone assumed was blood. Hearing whimpers from their supposed missing civilian, the team's commander decided to call a retreat. It was then that the MTF realized there were over 20 more wooden structures nearby. Each was of a different shape and size, but all of them were covered in rats that were staring at the Foundation operatives. These various pieces of wooden apparatuses seemed to resemble torture devices, and some of them had bodies inside. The MTF agents thought they had discovered the grisly fate of their missing civilian. Little did they know that things were far worse than they first seemed. The bodies and the torture devices were still alive. The Foundation soon realized there were upwards of 12,000 people within SCP-3667 and immediately began efforts to rescue as many as they could. Luckily, they had established a field base on site in the mine, close enough to the sinkhole that led into SCP-3667. However, the unfortunate reality was that saving all these trapped human beings was no small undertaking, and space at their nearby base, Site-574, was limited. Only 150 of the people were able to be recovered and were transported to Site-574. Those that were having been found trying to escape from SCP-3667 were being eaten by the various nightmarish creatures below. But what quickly became apparent was that these people, those safely recovered from SCP-3667, and those still trapped within, weren't exactly ordinary. When Team 1 had discovered the strange yellow-gray stream in SCP-3667, they had collected a sample of the fluid for analysis. Examining this sample revealed an anomalous molecular structure that would actively bond with organic matter, and this same unidentified molecule was present in the bloodstream of the human beings found beneath the sinkhole. It seemed to have bestowed each one of them with an anomalous ability for a limited form of regeneration. Their bodies could withstand far more damage than an average non-anomalous human. The Foundation even experimented with introducing the anomalous molecule into the blood of other test subjects, but it didn't have the same regenerative effect. It was assumed that the regeneration was linked directly to some other factor, and the molecule from the fluid only acted as a catalyst. As such, Every person recovered from the caverns was given the collective designation of SCP-3667-2. Now, various subspecies of strange creatures and a group of people whose bodies could regenerate, both living in a system of caverns beneath Mirni Sakha Republic, not to mention all the wooden torture devices that were being used on the SCP-3667-2s. Just what the hell was going on here? And what was it that made this discovery one of the Foundation's darkest secrets? Well, the answers to that could be discovered in what they learned next about the anomalous people they'd recovered from the sinkhole. As the Foundation continued its examination, their researchers at Site-574 happened upon a starting realization. The SCP-3667-2 people were perfect physical and genetic matches to former residents of the nearby town of Myrny. In fact, of the over 12,000 total, only 1,328 didn't appear to correspond to any known person from the area. But then, thousands of others all had proof of their existence that the Foundation was able to recover from the town's public records. Dates of birth, names, former places of residence, family, and next of kin, along with dates of death. The SCP-3667-2 instances all claim to have spent their entire lives underground, beneath the sinkhole where they were tortured endlessly by nightmarish creatures. Their bodies could regenerate the external damage they received, meaning the torture would go on for days, months, or even years at a time. 
When sampling bodies buried in local cemeteries, the Foundation discovered that these were in fact copies of deceased residents. But not everyone who had lived and died in Mirny, only those whose families had lived there for at least two generations, and who, while they were alive, were suspected of committing a crime but never convicted. There was one other unifying factor too. During their lives, these residents all had some affiliation with a particular religious group known as the Light of Five Heavens Russian Orthodox Church. To put it simply, SCP-3667 was hell. Following a number of other incursions involving SCP-3667-1 creatures, the Foundation was eventually able to open negotiations with the entities in order to ensure the continued stability of SCP-3667. The former director of Site-574, Midai Bokomi, was appointed as the Director of Hell and placed in charge of overseeing the anomaly. Under her watch, the Foundation would supposedly be relocating the displaced SCP-3667-2s to safe, classified locations where they could be reintegrated into society. However, in an email from the Director of Hell, she proposed a solution to the Foundation's dwindling number of D-Class personnel. I am happy to announce that something has come up that changes that. I'll be sending each of you a shipment of new D-Class come next week. It isn't as many as you had hoped for. But rest assured, these ones will withstand most anything you throw at them. Bodies all over the ground, necks twisted, faces contorted in terror. SCP-173, not one, but an army, scatters out through Site-19, massacring researchers one broken neck at a time. Pure chaos. How could this possibly have happened? The strobing of the blood-red emergency lighting was already fear-inducing enough, so was being hidden under one of the tables in the mess hall, trembling as the noise of alarms rang out through the facility. But the thing about the flickering lights scared SCP Foundation researcher Mira Smithy all the more, for the few seconds of darkness that came between each flash of red. If it had been any other containment breach, she probably wouldn't have even noticed, for in those few seconds, when the warning light lit up only to cut out, she couldn't see a thing and her not being able to see made it easier for them to move around. Mira had lost track of time since the alarms had first sounded to mark the containment breach. She tried to keep count of the minutes, but the drumming of her heartbeat had thrown her off. There was no way of knowing if it had been hours or only a few minutes since everything went wrong. Of course, the SCP Foundation had plenty of procedures and protocols in place to prevent or respond to situations like this. Yet the emergency alarms kept echoing through the corridors, lights plunging the facility into darkness every few seconds, only to break it up with a brief flash of red. It seemed to Mira from her hiding spot that this breach had proven far too much for the Foundation's extensive procedures to counteract. Maybe it was all over already, she thought after a few seconds, or maybe minutes under the table. What if they had gotten bored? tired of slaughtering their way through Foundation personnel and slunk back to their containment chamber. That would have been simpler, far less terrifying than the alternative that came creeping into Mira's head in the form of her next thought. What if she was the only one left alive, the last member of Sight personnel still breathing, just by some random hundred to one chance? And if that was the case, how long would it take for them to find her? How many even were there? A new sound, just detectable below the alarms, broke through her avalanche of anxious questions. Footsteps. The noise of boots clomping against the floor clearly belonging to a human and not one of them. Cautious as to which way her gaze was directed, Mira poked her head from out beneath the table, glancing around during the few seconds where the red of the emergency lights allowed her to see. The steps were getting closer, and as they did, Researcher Smithy realized something that made her fearful for her fellow survivor. They were running away, and there was no way they could do that while also looking back at what was coming after them. Over here! She hissed in a hushed tone at the sight of a pair of legs crossing a nearby corridor. Their thick standard-issue military boots seemed to match those worn by the Foundation's security personnel. The officer passed by, only to stop and tiptoe closer to the mess hall, having heard Mira's whispered call. With the red lights blinking, it looked like every other step the security officer took had been edited out, like they were teleporting closer in the dark. Watching intently from her hiding place, it reminded Mira sickeningly of the things she was hiding from, how they moved, 
and the worrying fact that she couldn't see one following the security officer. Hello? Hello? Called the man's voice as he entered the mess hall. Under the table, Mira whispered. If we hide, we can still see them, but they can't see us. Hiding? He replied. No, we need something I can revert these things back to the original. Uh, it was so much easier to handle when there was just one of them. Look, let's make a break for it. I'm gonna grab SCP-3108 and get the lights back on. If we can restore visibility, we might be able to stand a fighting chance against those things. The officer was looking around the cafeteria, trying to locate the source of Researcher Smithy's voice, eyes distracted. Then the intermittent flickering of red light cut off again, plunging the entire mess hall into near pitch darkness. At the same time, there was the sound of something heavy and stone scraping against the flooring. It turned Mira's stomach, and she immediately covered her mouth. She had no idea if they could hear her breathing. Could a creature of stone even detect sound at all? While the lights were down and the security guard's back was turned, a pair of sculptures, built from concrete and rebar, traces of spray paint over their stone skin, appeared behind the officer at impossible speed. There was a sickening crunch, followed by the sound of something dropping to the floor of the mess hall. As the emergency lights flicked back on, Mira could see them. The two copies of SCP-173 standing still next to the table she was under, bathed in red light. This nightmare had all begun as an otherwise ordinary Friday for the SCP Foundation. Only a few hours earlier, Mira had been brainstorming her latest pitch for a series of experiments involving SCP-914. Otherwise known as the Clockworks, SCP-914 was a large machine comprised of various cogs, gyros, and gears of unknown origin. Its function, however, had long been documented and was of great interest to the Foundation. Any object placed within SCP-914's input booth could be transformed, destroyed, or improved depending on the clockworks' setting. Rough would disintegrate the subject, coarse would dismantle it to its base components, and one-to-one -one would merely replace the object with a similar, almost identical one. Then there were the fine and very fine settings. The former would cause SCP-914 to improve any item, and the later is capable of the same but with one key difference. Very fine would refine an object even more, usually by giving it anomalous properties. The Foundation higher-ups had permitted staff to freely conduct tests using the clockworks, although approval was required, and all data was to be recorded. While many of the scientists at the Foundation were fixed on the mysterious origin of SCP-914, or the furthest extent of its refinement capabilities, Myra had been thinking about it in a far more practical way. She wasn't interested in the how or the why of SCP-914's inner workings, nor who had built it. Her experiments were born out of considering better usages for the clockworks. It was a machine that could provide endless possibilities, and Myra was determined to make it to the fullest use of it in order to solve actual real-world problems. Imagine for a moment, she announced, reading off her cue cards as she practiced pitching her experiment to the Foundation's senior researchers. Imagine a world where nobody ever gets sick, where human beings are able to live long, healthy, and prosperous lives. Uh, maybe dial back on the Star Trek. Her colleague, research assistant Jensen, interjected. Really? That's what you call constructive criticism? She retorted before continuing. If we apply the transformative refinement powers of SCP-914, that world could be the future that awaits us. For example, I'm proposing tests that involve placing man-made chemical compounds like painkillers, heart medication, and other potentially life-saving medicines through the clockwork's refinement process. I'm not suggesting we need to set it to very fine and create anomalous versions of these things, but what if, even on the fine setting, we're able to improve the effectiveness of our existing treatments for all kinds of afflictions? Jensen raised their hand, patiently waiting to comment like a child in a classroom. What? A uh, few things, they replied, lowering their hand. First off, some if not all man-made medications include some kind of organic component. The O5 Council have banned all- Yes, I'm fully aware of the containment procedures, Mira interrupted them. That's exactly why I'm trying to convince the Council, or hell, just even Dr. Bright, to let me step around. I genuinely believe we could be doing so much more with SCP-914, and I need them to see that. Look, I'm not here to rain on your parade, Smithy. 
her assistant reassured. I'm only bringing up concerns that anyone will have about this proposal. You talked about wanting to improve our existing medical treatments, which is noble, don't get me wrong, but have you considered the wider effect that might have? If you make everyone on Earth more resistant or even immune to everything, then diseases are going to evolve. What if we end up with a form of superbacteria resistant to all forms of medication, even if that medicine's been refined in SCP-914? Trying to save the world might just bring about its end. I've thought about that. But if the Council starts allowing for biological testing again, then the solution is obvious. We use the clockworks to eradicate whatever germs or diseases are able to develop after improving treatment options," Myra explained, then adding, Besides, that can't be any more dangerous than what we've been using SCP-914 for. I mean, enhancing other SCPs, that's a recipe for disaster. Got to agree with you there, Jensen sighed. Even without placing them in the clockworks, the Foundation's been way too cavalier with the dangerous ones. Speaking of, you know what tonight is, Smithy replied with a confused look. Date night, they stated. Elsewhere in the facility, unknown to researcher Smithy at that time, one of the dangerous SCPs Jensen had mentioned had been let out of containment. This was a regular occurrence, even if it was considered a little unorthodox to some. In fact, the only reason that the O5 Council so often turned a blind eye to it was because of the researcher it involved, Dr. Alto Clef. It seemed Clef had a certain fondness for SCP-173, the sculpture, a living statue constructed from concrete and rebar that could travel at impossible speeds whenever it was unobserved. Most Friday nights, Clef would have romantic candlelit dinners with SCP-173, putting a dress and blonde wig on the sculpture and treating it like his beloved partner. The whole while watched by Dr. Clef and a group of D-Class acting as waiters and cooks, SCP-173 would stand motionless while the bizarre date went on late into the night. It was no secret that the sculpture was a highly aggressive creature, with a penchant for snapping the neck of the nearest person the moment that they blinked. However, it was only because of Dr. Clef's reputation and track record for the elimination of anomalies that he was granted the special privilege of whining and dining with SCP-173. This time though, partway through their regularly scheduled date, Dr. Clef was called away to deal with matters relating to another anomaly he'd been charged with decommissioning. The pair of D-Class waiting on the doctor and his date were instructed to wait, keep a close eye on SCP-173, alerting each other in case they needed to blink. It was a hell of a gamble, a risk that could have been avoided if the sculpture had been transported back to its secure containment chamber. But Dr. Clef could be persuasive. That is to say, he threatened both D-Class waiters with a bludgeoning from his ukulele if they didn't do as he asked. Both the D-Classes stared directly at the sculpture, each one feeling the anxious beads of sweat slowly crawling down their foreheads, worried that they'd both blink at the same time by accident. They announced their need to refresh their eyes every so often, alternating between being the watcher and the one allowed to blink. All the while, SCP-173 was motionless. Perhaps it was patiently waiting for Dr. Clef to return, or for one of the D-Class watching to slip up. As if through some cruel twist of fate, a fly began to buzz through the air, drifting towards the D-Class with their eyes on SCP-173. It looped and darted around, its wings making an annoying droning. One of the waiters announced he needed to blink again, and the other told him he was free to do so while he kept watch over the sculpture. At the exact same moment that one man blinked, the fly zipped its way towards the second D-Class, distracting him again and drawing his gaze for a little more than a millisecond. That fly whizzing past was the last thing he saw. As SCP-173 darted forward, it moved with such incredible speed that it was imperceptible, grabbing the nearby D-Class, the one who'd spotted the fly, and killing him instantly before the other could even open his eyes. When he did, SCP-173 had vanished from its spot at the date night table, nowhere to be seen. Before the remaining D-Class could realize it was behind him, SCP-173 had made short work of its other observer. It began zipping unseen through the corridors of the SCP Foundation facility. Dr. Clef had returned to his date only to find the two D-Class waiters dead, and SCP-173 missing. Immediately, he had raised the alarm, meaning that research staff were too busy fleeing to safely pay any attention to the sculpture quickly making its way through the site. Swept up in the evacuation, half deafened by the alarms, in all the commotion, researcher Myra Smithy hadn't even realized she'd left the door to the clockworks wide open. Shuffling down a corridor with her fellow researchers, the lights suddenly went out. A few nearby screamed in panic at having been unceremoniously thrust into the dark. Myra blindly reached for Jensen's hand, 
only to hear the sounds of multiple heavy concrete feet dragging along the floor. Suddenly, the emergency lights blinked. She turned, and to her horror, she saw SCP-173 with its stony arms around Jensen's neck, their face stricken with sheer terror, tears in their eyes. But now, Myra quickly realized, as the corridor was filled with shrieks of fear from the other researchers, that there was more than one sculpture now. Myra barely managed to escape with her life in all the confusion, crawling out of the low-lit corridor on her hands and knees, while the multiple new SCP-173 instances slaughtered anyone that couldn't see them. Since then, she had been hiding, hearing the scraping steps of the sculptures traveling around the facility unobserved. They had attacked the fuse boxes first, as if in a calculated tactical move, take out the lights, and suddenly everyone found it much harder to see them. Even through the fear, it was hard for Mira not to blame herself for all the chaos. She couldn't remember whether she'd left the door to SCP-914 open or not, but it hadn't taken her long to figure out that the clockworks had something to do with this madness. Somehow, SCP-173 had made its way there, had been able to operate the machinery while the Foundation staff were distracted by their own evacuation. Presumably, with SCP-914 set to very fine, the sculpture had been transformed into its ultimate refined form, or multiple forms, it seemed. There was a veritable horde of SCP-173s running amok through the facility. It made sense, Myra reasoned, in some twisted, cruel, anomalous way. The sculpture had only ever been a danger when unobserved. The second anyone took their eyes off of it, so much as blinked, it would strike. How does a machine like SCP-914 improve upon that? Easy. It gives the sculpture the power to replicate itself. Anyone can look at multiple things at once, of course, but nobody can look at everything simultaneously. Even if someone was watching a pair or three SCP-173s, one more could easily slip up behind them for the kill. Still hidden under the table, Myra's eyes were locked on the pair of sculptures in the mess hall, the body of the security officer out of focus in her peripheral vision. She dared not look away, frozen in sheer fear that the second she blinked, they would lift up the table and find her. She had been so overwhelmed, so paralyzed with her terror, that she had forgotten about the lights. As the emergency lighting flickered again, the sculptures both moved, shifting across the mess hall as the room went dark, only to stop in place the second Myra could see them again. They hadn't gotten closer. In fact, both looked to be leaving. The only thing keeping them here was her. She was watching them, and it had frozen them in place. Their greatest strength, the imperceptible movement and speed of SCP-173 was offset by an indisputable weakness of their anomalous biology. They couldn't stop someone from looking at them, and couldn't stop themselves becoming still, solid concrete when they were being watched. Mulling over her options, Myra decided to follow through with the plan from the fallen security guard to retrieve SCP-3108 and try to undo what the clockworks had done. Slowly, she slipped out from under the table, keeping both eyes on the pair of sculptures, keeping them lashed to one spot as she gradually backed out of the mess hall. The lights went out and plunged the area into darkness again, and researcher Smithy could hear the heavy concrete scraping of the two sculptures looking for her as she blindly made her way through the facility. She managed to evade the roaming stone creatures, resisting her natural instinct to hide and looking directly at any she encountered on the way, making sure to stay out of their view. If she saw them, she'd freeze them. If they saw her, they'd chase her. Eventually, fishing SCP-3108 out of a containment box, Myra held the weapon in her hand. It was a heavily modified Nerf gun, which she loaded a foam dart into and pulled the plastic slide back. The creatively named Nerfing Gun had almost the opposite effect of SCP-914. Instead of improving something, SCP-3108 turned whatever was shot with it into an inferior equivalent object, something worse than itself. It just might work. Drawing the gun as she heard the sound of scraping concrete getting nearer and nearer, Myra turned the corner coming face to face with one of the sculptures. She held the gun high, closing the gap between them, making sure she didn't miss, but wary she needed to fire before the lights blinked off again. She squeezed the plastic trigger, sending the foam dart shooting out of the barrel of the nerfing gun. The flimsy projectile collided with the SCP-173 instance, bouncing off its head and landing on the floor. For a split second, the lights dimmed again, then came back on. Myra's heart had lurched in her chest, only to see that the sculpture hadn't moved at all. She leaned closer to it, blinking intentionally. It still didn't move. 
It was rooted to the ground, fixed, just a statue, rendered powerless by the nerfing gun. Excitedly, Myra knelt down and scrabbled on the floor to retrieve the dart, just as the emergency lighting flickered out again. In her excitement, Myra was too focused on reloading SCP-3108, that is, until she heard the shuffling of concrete and rebar behind her. The lights were still out and she fumbled blindly for the foam dart, as the noise got closer and closer. Her fingertips brushed the projectile, knocking it further away, when suddenly the lights came back up. But as she reached for it, Researcher Smithy felt a large, cold presence behind her, something huge and heavy, and made of stone and lingering at the very corner of her eye. Before she could turn around and face it, something grabbed Myra, and a sickening snap rang out through the corridor. He had been pacing back and forth all night. So many hours spent walking to and fro in his quarters that his feet were starting to develop painful blisters. Yet Jace couldn't bring himself to stay still after his unsettling discovery. Over the course of the night, it had driven him almost mad. But it wasn't just the fear of the inevitable calamity he had learned of that was keeping him up and worrying him into a state of near insanity. It was the lie, the smokescreen that had been used to cover up the truth and it came all the way from the top. Jace Jacoby had been working as a researcher within the SCP Foundation for the better part of a decade. Sure, it wasn't an easy job at the best of times. In fact, it could be dirty, dangerous, and even downright deadly work. But Jace had learned to take comfort in the bigger picture, and it cultivated in him a loyalty for the Foundation and what they stood for. The reassuring knowledge that he was playing but one small part in protecting the world from anomalous threats usually helped him sleep a little easier at night. This was not one of those nights. Completely by accident, the researcher had learned of a terrible truth. He'd seen a lot of horrible things while working at the Foundation, from one horrific, endlessly regenerating omnicidal reptile to a monstrous creature comprised primarily of giant teeth protruding from its body. But what he had uncovered in the depths of the SCP Foundation's own archive terrified him for a whole different reason. Because it seemed to undo every good thing Jace and all the other personnel had done in the name of the Foundation. He believed that they were the good guys, that their efforts were to prevent total global destruction. Instead, it turned out that they were just pawns. Being familiar with a whole filing cabinet's worth of special containment procedures for various anomalies, Jace was familiar with the term 220 Calabasas. He'd even almost been considered to receive high enough security clearance to be given the full details as to what it entailed. He was aware already that it was the name given to a process that was required to be performed by Foundation staff as a way to keep SCP-2317 actively contained. SCP-2317 was a wooden door leading to another dimension, or at least, it appeared to be. After accessing some restricted files, a suppressed secondary level of information hidden underneath the SCP-2317 entry, Jace discovered what was really going on. SCP-2317 was, in part, a door to another world, as its nickname suggested. But that wasn't the whole story. Beyond the door lay a barren salt plain, the only structures visible for miles being seven identical stone pillars, with ancient symbols carved into their surface. Frequently, a small group of Foundation personnel and security staff would be sent into SCP-2317, each one of them given a specific role to undertake as they performed 220 Calabasas. That process required for active containment was more like an occult ritual, involving holy water, an obsidian-edged knife, chants that invoked ancient powerful gods, and a chicken to act as a live sacrifice. If Jace had just learned those specifics of 220 Calabasas, he wouldn't have realized that the ritual was actually a phony, even a pretty convincing one at that. Buried beneath the pillars was chained something of unspeakable, unknowable power. It had gone by many names, each invoking a particularly nasty sense of trepidation. The Sire of Tyranny, Kural Irbrav, or simply the Devourer of Worlds. The 220 Calabasas ritual was supposedly a way to keep the beast locked below, to strengthen the seven chains each latching the ancient monstrosity to the pillars above. Except it didn't. It was a smokescreen. The ritual did nothing to keep the shackles of the Devourer intact. There was but one chain remaining, one more tether keeping the ancient beast caged. And over the years, no matter how many times the Foundation performed 220 Calabasas, 
It was eroding, getting weaker and weaker. It was inevitable. The devourer of worlds would one day be free. And yet, that wasn't even the worst part about what Jace had uncovered. What could possibly be worse than learning an eldritch deity intent on unfurling doom couldn't be contained with the one method the Foundation had? Well, it was that the Foundation knew, and had known for a long time that 220 Calabasas was nothing more than a charade, with all the effectiveness of a band-aid over a broken leg. As if that wasn't bad enough, Jace had traced the source of this cover-up right to the very top, to the highest operational level within the SCP Foundation's hierarchy. The O5 Council was responsible. They had known for a long, long time about the ineffectiveness of 220 Calabasas, and yet hadn't pursued any more permanent solutions to the looming threat posed by SCP-2317 and the Devourer. After a sleepless night, Jace could hold it in no longer. He had to tread carefully, given how far up the chain this conspiracy went. It was hard to know who to trust. Something had to be done, that much was clear to him. Whether that involved sealing or outright destroying SCP-2317. But if those tasked with overseeing the entire Foundation were in on this cover-up, then Jace had to be extremely careful about who he went to for help. There was only one person he was certain he could rely on, and share his findings with in secrecy. Senior researcher Alice had long been a good friend of Jace's. In fact, he'd even go so far as to say Ellis was his only real friend within the Foundation. The more experienced member of personnel had practically mentored Jacoby from his earliest days as an SCP researcher. Ellis had helped him get to grips with certain difficult containment procedures, and even taken the fall for Jace after some of his early mistakes nearly caused a containment breach. Researcher Ellis's seniority meant he only got away with a metaphorical slap on the wrist. But most crucially for Jace right now, Ellis wasn't a high enough rank to be even close to any of the upper echelon Foundation doctors, like Dr. Bright or Dr. Gears. Nor was he senior enough to have any direct dealings with the O5 Council. If there was anyone working at the Foundation that Jace could possibly confide in about his findings regarding the truth behind SCP-2317 and 220 Calabasas, it was Ellis. And maybe between them. The pair could put their heads together and avert the catastrophe of the Devourer's inevitable escape. Jace was nervously pacing back and forth while Ellis's eyes were glued to the terminal in his quarters. He had shown him a saved copy of the full archive entry on SCP-2317, detailing everything. Not just the steps required to perform 220 Calabasas, but the additional information about the ritual not working, and that the O5 Council knew it. After a long, painful wait for researcher Ellis to scan through the entire file, he leaned back from the terminal screen and sighed. Well, this is hardly ideal, he stated matter-of-factly. Hardly ideal? Jace echoed, his fear of what all this meant manifesting itself as a frustrated outburst. I think you might be underestimating it a little there, Ellis. This isn't just some mild inconvenience we've now got to live with. We're talking about the end of the world as we know it, XK class. And on top of that, the Council knows it's coming and are doing nothing about it. Instead, they're making these high-clearance personnel go and pointlessly slaughter chickens and recite meaningless prayers about seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King! Jacoby, calm down, Ellis replied sternly. Let's talk about this rationally. For all we know, this file here could be a part of SCP-2317's containment procedures. That's what I'm saying. The procedure is ineffective, he argued. Let me finish. The senior researcher responded calmly. We know of dozens of other anomalies that employ infohazardous or mimetic effects, and sometimes it's not uncommon for entities of such nature with capabilities to infect information itself to be combated via the use of deliberate, necessary, misinformation. This file might not even be an accurate description of SCP-2317. It could easily be a method for containing something else. No, that doesn't... Jace paused, holding his forehead. Sorry, all of this is giving me a headache. Could I trouble you for some water? Of course, Ellis answered. He got up from his seat and filled a plastic cup from a cooler in his quarters. While his back was turned, Jacoby didn't see Ellis slip something into the water. Thanks, Ellis, Jace said as he gulped down the whole cup. Like I was saying, that theory of it being a mimetic threat doesn't make sense. You've seen SCP-2317 from a distance. We both have. It's a physical, dimensional gateway. I mean, a door to another world is literally its code name, for God's sake. Why? Would there be a real door with an intangible info hazard behind it? Ellis stroked his chin, pondering quietly. 
For a moment, Jace's vision seemed to get a little blurry, but he blinked it away. Okay, so if we take everything in the SCP-2317 file as gospel, then answer me this. What do you propose we do about it? His mentor asked. We have to think radically. Together, I think you and I need to come up with an alternate permanent solution to the impending threat posed by SCP-2317. Then we present it to the O5 Council, storm into their chamber if necessary, and demand them to implement it. The next 220 Calabasas is scheduled for a few hours from now. We need to bring them something that will actually work, not just that performative pantomime they put on as a smokescreen. Otherwise, Alice... Uh, Jace paused for a moment, hearing his own voice crack with despair. If we don't, the Devourer is going to destroy everything. You said the words permanent solution. Elaborate for me, please. Ellis responded. Look, I think we have only two options, the frightened researcher said. Jace noticed he was starting to feel drowsy, lightheaded even, needing to shake himself to stay upright and conscious. We either find a way to seal SCP-2317, or we destroy the door to another world outright. The 220 Calabasas procedure? The, no, rit, rit, ritu, ritual. They take a one kiloton nuke in, with them um, in case of containment failure, right? We detonate one of those inside the dimension, pray that it kills the devour, devour of wor worlds. Then we shut the door and blow, blow that up behind his two. Suddenly, Jace's legs gave out underneath him like they couldn't support his body weight anymore. He landed on the floor with a thud, while Ellis loomed over him with a sympathetic look on his lined face. He... he drug... me? Jace barely managed to get the question out. I'm sorry, Jacoby. Ellis sighed. Believe me when I say I would have preferred to talk you out of these seditious thoughts. But duty to the Foundation comes first. You understand. The door opened. The heavy clomping of boots against the floor. Jace could barely turn to see the squad of security guards entering the room. They lifted his body up off the ground, getting limper by the second, and began dragging him out by his arms. With all his waning strength, he kicked and thrashed his legs as they trailed beneath him. Being taken away by the guards, Jace yelled for his mentor's help. He kept trying until his voice became slurred, imperceptible sounds, not even words anymore. The world around him started sinking into darkness as whatever he'd been dosed with took full effect. As Jace was hauled off struggling, not once did Ellis dare to look him in the eye. Jace had no idea how much time had passed, only that he'd been chemically knocked unconscious for most of it. Opening his heavy eyelids, he had no idea where he was. The room around him was in pitch darkness. For a second, he'd wondered if he'd been executed by the Foundation and was currently dead, his consciousness trapped in an endless inky void. Then another concerning thought pushed its way into his head. Had they thrown him into the Devourer of Worlds prison? It was a cruel, callous move, even for the SCP Foundation, to offer Jace up as a sacrifice for daring to look further into the truth behind SCP-2317. A column of light cut through the dark from somewhere above him, gleaming down so bright that it was hard to look directly at it. The spotlight did little to illuminate the rest of the room, although squinting in the dark, the researcher could detect the outlines of several figures sat in a circle facing him. Thirteen of them, to be exact, with one extra taking their seat. He was just awake enough to remember a crucial detail that explained where he was. There were thirteen members of the O5 Council, along with one administrator. Hello again, researcher Jacoby, came a voice from one of the seats encircling him. Tell us, do you know why you're here? You... Jay stuttered before his fear once again erupted in an explosive outburst. You all knew about SCP-2317. You had us perform 220 Calabasas time and time again, knowing that it was doing nothing to keep the Devourer contained. If that creature gets loose, no, when it does, it will destroy everything and everyone. The Foundation is meant to contain anomalies, not pretend to. We have a duty to every adult child on this planet to protect them from this entity. Do not exposit the Foundation's mandates to us, Jacobi. Another of the Council members' voices replied, sounding not in the least bit concerned. If anything, they sounded bored. The SCP Foundation acts in accordance with what the Council dictates, not by whatever moral framework you have chosen to impose on this organization. But the Devourer of Worlds is coming, Jace pleaded. You all know as much! I I've seen it in the SCP-2317 file! Inevitable! You used that exact word! 
We are aware of the threat faced by SCP-2317-K, or the Devourer as you called it, a third council member interjected. But rest assured, at the time 220 Calabasas was established to provide an illusion of containment. We calculated it would take several decades for the final chain holding the creature to give way. That time might have already elapsed, the researcher argued. And in the meantime, we have no countermeasures prepared, no strategy, and the rest of the personnel have no idea that this threat is coming. Huh. Almost exactly the same wording as last time, one council member said, not addressing the rest directly, but still just audible enough for Jace to detect it. What do you mean, last time? Yes, thinking back a few short moments to the beginning of this exchange. Wait, why, why did you say hello again when I woke up here? There was a horrible, nauseating silence throughout the room for a moment. Jace had already worked out the answer. Why would the council bother telling him the truth now? I've figured this out before, haven't I? He said. A handful of times, one of the voices replied. If not you, then another member of personnel. Every now and then someone snoops, uncovers something they shouldn't, and you make them forget it. Jace finishes their sentence for them. Before we apply the amnestics, the voice said, observe, today's 220 Calabasas procedure is already underway. A huge curved screen blinked to life. It filled half the circumference of the room but wasn't enough to give Jace any clearer of a look at the O5 Council. Each one of them was cast as shadowy, silhouetted figures against the images now appearing on the screen. It was footage being streamed live from one of the personnel cleared to enter SCP-2317. They were already in the middle of performing the phony ritual, spritzing holy water over the seven pillars, unaware that one of them was still linked to a chain keeping the Devourer imprisoned below. Suddenly, there was a rumbling, a shaking reverberating through the ground on the video feed like an earthquake, or something moving underneath. Oh my god. Jace breathed as he watched in horror. It's happening! The Devourer is coming now! Get them out of there! Some of the O5s mumbled awkwardly to themselves. We shouldn't act with too much haste. It could just be the creature reacting to the ritual, one hypothesized. It's been in prison for a lot longer than a lot of us have lived. It's bound to get restless, another concurred. Besides, the security team are armed with a nuclear device in case the worst should happen. On the screen, the tremors were continuing. The personnel member in charge of applying the holy water dropped the silver aspergillum and asporium containing it, spilling its contents over the salted earth below. Without any further warning, the ground started to crumble in the feed, an enormous clawed hand bursting up from underground. It was followed by the hulking shape of something much larger breaking through the salt plain sending a tidal wave towards the personnel member whose body cam footage was being displayed. The feed cut out, and the room was dark once again. It's too late. Jay stared at the council in a mix of terror and disgust. You did nothing and now it's too late! Before any of them could reply, another tremor rang out, this time beneath Jace's own feet. The Devourer of Worlds was here. It was bursting through the wooden door of SCP-2317 and tearing the Foundation facility apart with its immense size as it emerged. The walls cracked, the entire building beginning to crumble around him and the O5 Council, who were all hurriedly exiting the chamber to whatever plans or bunkers they had to ensure their own personal survival. Suddenly, the huge weight of something dropped through the dark and collapsed on top of Jace. Standing up amongst the wreckage of the obliterated building, the Devourer of Worlds drew itself up to its full height. It was an impossibly large creature, humanoid and obese. Its entire body was covered head to toe in thick, armored scales, with horns atop its jawless head. From one of them hung the final chain, a withered shackle no longer keeping the monster held within its underground prison. The seven chains had all failed. The ritual, 220 Calabasas, had failed. In fact, it never worked in the first place. Far below, his arms pinned painfully under a heavy slab of concrete, Jay stared up at the towering form of the Devourer. He had felt scared as the building came down around him, and even now, there was a lingering fear of his own death. But there was something else there, too. A sense of feeling oddly relieved. Not necessarily glad to be right about the impending doom, or even pleased to know this ancient trap deity was about to destroy the whole planet. But at least the Devourer of Worlds was honest, he thought. There was no subterfuge. No rituals acting as a smokescreen. No more lies. Just an honest simplicity of a creature whose only goal was to bring an end to everything. As Jace watched, the Devourer raised its hands up, reaching the highest pinnacle of the sky, then brought them straight back down to Earth.
It plunged both deep into the skin of the world, deep enough to crack the very surface open. Mantle and magma were spewing everywhere, like blood from the gaping wounds it left in the planet. Jace Jacoby closed his eyes as the ground beneath where he lay trapped ripped open, plummeting him into the dark. Step right up, folks! We've got all kinds of refreshing and tasty treats here for you today! Popcorn, peanuts, cotton candy, and even fried dough! Yes, sir, here at SCP Explained, we're offering the top-of-the-line anomalous delectable foodstuffs for all your circus-themed fun-time occasions! And that's because today, yes, today, on this YouTube platform, our infamous acronym doesn't stand for Secure, Contain, Protect. It stands for Sweet Confectionery Products. And let me tell you, dear viewer, the SCP we're looking at today just might be the most decadent, durable, and dangerous dessert that's ever desired to be devoured. We're talking about SCP-3077, or as they are better known, the Sugar Golems. These little fellas are safe class and are so totally harmless, so long as you take the proper precautions. What's the matter, don't you believe me? Don't you think it's nice of us to cover a safe SCP now and again? And hey now, why all this dull talk about rules and regulations in the first place? You don't go out to the carnival to not take wild and exciting risks? Every spinny, twirly, and whirly ride on the fairgrounds comes with a statistically higher chance of a tragic mishap befalling you and any other thrill-seekers around you. But we all take that chance anyway for the extraordinary rush of the experience. And such is the wacky and wonderful ways of our adorable and questionably edible chums, the sugar golems. Don't you just love them, folks? Ain't they a sight for sore eyes and a pang for sweet teeth? Well, we're only just getting started. The best is yet to come, ladies and not ladies. So pull up a chair and be sure to watch what we've got in store. You can make like a piece of old candy and stick around. Now that's a knee slapper, ain't it? <laughs> Sit back, relax, and make sure to enjoy the show. You should also subscribe to SCP Explained if you'd like to continue to be entertained. Hey, that rhymed! What do you know? I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. Ha! <laughs> Out roll. While SCP-3077 refers to the anomalous substance contained in Site-81, the semi-humanoid instances, which are nicknamed sugar golems, are themselves an animate and independent byproduct that naturally spawns from SCP-3077 when it is allowed to exist outside of containment procedures. The most important of these containment procedures being that SCP-3077 must remain at a constant temperature of well below its freezing point and only be stored in containers full to capacity, lest its aforementioned byproducts attempt to breach containment. The total volume of SCP-3077 within the cryogenic containment unit equals almost 2200 liters, and it is believed to be the only known quantity of the anomalous substance in existence. For the sake of clarity in distinguishing between SCP-3077 and its byproducts, we'll be referring to the main object contained by the Foundation as SCP-3077 while the gooey little guys who we know to spontaneously split off from the source of SCP-3077 will be regarded as SCP-3077-1. As mentioned before, SCP-3077-1 instances have been affectionately dubbed the Sugar Golems. Every instance of SCP-3077-1 resembles an approximately one meter tall gaunt humanoid composed of a pure sugar-derived substance commonly known as Treacle. And that's molasses for all y'all yeehaw cowboys over there in the US of A. If you've ever played the classic board game Candyland, you'll have some idea of what an individual instance of SCP-3077 looks like from the beloved and often remembered character of Gloppy, who lives in the molasses swamp section of the board and is also fittingly made out of molasses himself. Yes indeed, Gloppy is truly a delight for a weary Candyland player to meet. What did you say? Are you folks too young to know about Candyland? Well, that factoid certainly makes this narrator feel pretty old. Then again, I am taking on the mannerisms and attire of an old-fashioned carnival barker, so I suppose a bit of novel antiquity comes with the territory. Regardless, the golems are each composed of roughly seven liters of sweet, syrupy goodness. And very much like everyone's favorite character, Gloppy, they all lack defined lower bodies and can all emote through crude yet oddly endearing vocalizations in the place of intelligible speech. While their facial features are simplistic and misshapen, the contours of concave eyes and gaping mouth are usually present. The exact number of these eyes and mouths is subject to variation, much like the color of the board spaces in a wonderful wholesome family game of Candyland. 
While each SCP-3077-1 instance is around the same size, the body proportions and overall shape of each instance are rather fluid, pun fully intended. Some possess oversized arms or bulbous heads, while others might be conjoined to an adjacent sugar golem, as if to show that the two are inseparable as a pair of best buddies. Or, as some others might put it, a couple of BFFFs, best friends for fancy frolicking. They really are quite friendly looking, aren't they? And aren't they, they sure are. For the only thing that these sugary sweet SCP instances want is to be in the company of human beings just like you. Yes, you! Who else would I be talking to? It's a hard life for this worn down Connie, let me tell you. These little sugar golems love what they do and do what they love. But that doesn't mean that it's time for fun and games. Even though SCP-3077-1 instances want to hang around human beings, they don't tend to stop at hey and hello or whatever those appropriate greetings sound like when they are being gurgled by a diminutive molten sugar monster. Things can get out of hand real fast. Just like an orange cream popsicle melting in the sun of a late summer's day. Now listen up, it's important that you pay attention to what I say next. I'm about to book learn you about what to do if an instance of SCP-3077-1 enters your personal space. The results of prolonged contact with this SCP can end badly if you're not careful. I'm not going to sugarcoat any of the chewy details of your grisly fate, and I promise that it won't be a cakewalk. So don't be a nerd and listen up. Yes, that's right, I called you a nerd. You know, like nerds, the candy. How do you folks seriously not know nerds? They were a classic Halloween candy from the Wonka Company, and they were very popular back in the day. Oh, what's that you say? How long ago was it back in the day for me? Uh, that's a bit of a rude question, wouldn't you say? Oh, why I oughta... Won't you go ahead and knock it off with the wise guy questions? What are you, a pack of smarties? Ha <laughs> ha, I said smarties, get it? It's just like the... Ah, never mind. Let's just move on to the explanation of how to survive a close encounter with this SCP. That was the main reason you came all this way to this here educational and entertaining video presentation after all. To pick up where I left off, instances of SCP-3077-1 have a tendency to seek out nearby human life. The reason for doing so is surprisingly simple and alarmingly, well, alarming. These sticky saccharine simulacra are solely set on slithering into people's mouths for the purposes of gaining total control of their bodies. Yes, you heard that right. Believe it or not, the same anomalous property which animates the sugar golem's treacle bodies is apparently capable of overriding the human nervous system from the inside. And that's no joke, folks. While these tasty treats might sound sweet to eat, you'll be a puppet of meat from your head to your feet if you don't complete the tasks I entreat. If an instance of SCP-3077-1 attempts to enter your mouth, you must remember first and foremost to keep your trap shut blocking it with a mask or a similar article of clothing if need be. Next, you must use your limbs and all available implements to batter the attacking golem away, while you do your best to keep a distance of at least arm's reach between yourself and the instance. It should come as a relief to our rational people that SCP-3077-1 instances are severely limited in their physical capabilities, and an adult human of average fitness can easily hold one off if they know what to expect. The tricky part comes from the amorphous properties of the instance's viscous treacle bodies, as well as their anomalous ability to regenerate from any physical trauma. The only way to permanently destroy an instance of SCP-3077-1 is to expose it to temperatures above its melting point, which for you sticklers out there is approximately 176 degrees Celsius. The most effective weapons against SCP-3077-1 instances include Firebombs, flamethrowers, and your run-of-the-mill convection ovens. If it is at all possible to contain the instance within a sealed vessel such as a large Tupperware or wooden barrel, mm -hmm. then you ought to do whatever you can to prevent the candy creeps from running amok. While ordinary below zero temperatures are unable to destroy the anomalous treacle of SCP-3077, instances of SCP-3077-1 can effectively be slowed down or stopped completely if you put them on ice. Whether it's the hot foot or the cold shoulder, some form of extreme temperature should always be weaponized when defending oneself from an SCP-3077-1 instance. Any attempt to crush or smash an SCP-3077-1 instance will only result in the bad bonbon breaking apart and reforming into several more belligerent bite-sized blighters. 
A human under siege by the sugar golems might find themselves quickly outnumbered if they foolishly attempt to use a melee weapon against the anomalies. Basically, it's like a more delicious version of the popular arcade video game Asteroids. No? Eh, I guess that reference was from before even my time. At any rate, instances of SCP-3077-1 are difficult to destroy without access to heat or freezing. The tendency of the molasses menaces to increase in number is made even worse because of the fact that any amount of SCP-3077 outside of containment can generate a nearly infinite number of SCP-3077-1. While even an army of SCP-3077-1 instances is far weaker than an equivalent pack of hunting animals, the ability to continuously multiply and physiology that doesn't experience the consequences of fatigue means that, given enough time, the sugar golems can outlast any amount of human resistance until they roll over their preferred prey like a slow, insurmountable, syrupy tsunami of surrender! Seriously scary stuff, some would say. But what happens next is the real kicker, folks. Mind this ballyhoo's somber spiel. If an instance of SCP-3077-1 manages to, against all odds, clamber its way into a human chatterbox and hijack the poor sap's nervous system, the victim is immediately classified as SCP-3077-2. SCP-3077-2 instances are easily distinguished from unaffected humans on sight alone. Dark tendrils of SCP-3077 can be seen visibly moving beneath the skin, and often emerge from the mouth to crisscross the instance's face, like makeup, the world's most disturbing circus clown. That's not all! After the tragic treacly transformation takes place, the movements exhibited by the instance of SCP-3077-2 will become crooked and jerky like a marionette puppeteered by a frustrated chimpanzee! During this time, the instance remains fully conscious, retaining whatever cognitive faculties it has possessed previous to its classification, but it is unable to attempt speech or exert autonomy over its own actions. This fun fact was discovered by studying the EEG recordings of several SCP-3077-2 instances, and is brought to you by the United Guild of the Existentially Terrified. If an instance of SCP-3077-2 happens to wander its way into the vicinity of any humans that haven't succumbed to the process of consuming SCP-3077-1, it will proceed to put on a jaunty performance for its newfound audience. This peculiar display involves clumsy efforts at dance choreography and the throaty singing of unsettling atonal melodies that would make your annoying cousin's road trip song sound like they're in tune. These awkward performances continue until the audience departs from the view of SCP-3077-2 instance, or the instance expires. This confirms that the point of the gesture is to entertain, as without an audience, the SCP-3077-2 instance is not compelled to make any noises of its own accord, and in general doesn't do anything other than move around aimlessly. In the event that any number of SCP-3077-1 instances escapes from containment, and causes the creation of SCP-3077-2, members of the Mobile Task Force are instructed to never stray from the line of sight of a currently performing SCP-3077-2 instance, and to approach it steadily, before restraining the instance while causing minimal harm to the body. SCP-3077-2 instances can be useful for running further tests on the anomalous properties of SCP-3077, and there are simple procedures that allow an instance to be kept alive indefinitely in containment. Any damage sustained during capture can severely hamper the efficiency of these life-sustaining procedures. The worst case scenario is that an SCP-3077-2 instance expires before being securely contained, as this will cause the SCP-3077-1 instance to emerge from its host and resume its relentless attack on all nearby humans. It is far easier to simply deal with SCP-3077-2 instances accordingly, and this is because SCP-3077-2 only ever attempts to continue the performance and possesses neither the intention nor the capacity for retaliation. If it is deemed necessary for the effectiveness of a recapture effort, it can be permissible for the Mobile Task Force to allow instances of SCP-3077-1 outside of containing to find purchase within SCP-3077-2 to increase the ease of containment and lessen the risk of Foundation personnel being affected. The performances of SCP-3077-2 instances are rarely physically intensive enough to make capture too difficult, but it can be said that the whimsical antics of these affected humans are anything but predictable. 
during some rare and special performances, and if the SCP-3077-1 instance in control of SCP-3077-2 instance is feeling especially daring, it may try to show off an array of woefully inadequate acrobatic skills. Front flips that are more like belly flops, back flips that could be mistaken for pretfalls, and the sort of type road pan trapeze acts that are better left to the imagination. In lieu of prior incidents, the Foundation strongly advises that if for any reason an instance of SCP-3077-2 must exist in containment, it must always be prevented from being at an altitude of more than six feet from the surface of the floor, especially if any humans it would perceive as an audience are located directly beneath where its performance would take place. Regarding the creation of further instances of SCP-3077-2, requests from any level of Foundation personnel at Site-81 or elsewhere must be granted permission to proceed by SCP-3077's head researcher because of the horrific implications of what happens to the still-aware human mind while the body is affected by SCP-3077-1. This process is only to be approved for use on D-Class personnel. That's right! And even then, in the event that all the rigmarole of the paperwork goes through, it is not acceptable to create an instance of SCP-3077-2 merely for the purpose of providing live entertainment to fellow researchers. After all, not a single one of us should be quick to forget the grotesque and highly regrettable spectacle that was Dr. Dietz's deplorable D-Class dancers. Every researcher involved with that ethical nightmare was reprimanded severely and the colorful novelty costumes and jangling bells that all former D-Class personnel were made to wear after being reclassified to SCP-3077-2 have been permanently confiscated. Let the cotton candy machine and peanut dispenser located just outside the containment unit of SCP-3077 serve as a stern reminder that there's a time and place for monkey shines and tomfoolery, and sometimes, yes, even now and then, a highly secure Foundation facility is neither the right place nor the right time. In case you haven't picked up on it, there are very few practical applications of SCP-3077 due to the fact that its status as a food dish is negated by the consequences of consumption. The main reason for tests to be administered on SCP-3077-2 instances is to discover if there is a safe method of extracting an SCP-3077-1 instance from the body of its host without causing the expiration of the original human. Unfortunately, due to a persistent lack of success, the experiments have been discontinued indefinitely. But that just won't do. How else are we supposed to know if these things actually taste as good as they look? I won't rest until everyone is able to harmlessly ingest a sugar golem of their very own. I might be old-fashioned, but to me, the safe object class isn't just a designation, it's an invitation. I ought to be completely okay doing whatever I like around a safe object because it's safe. That word should actually mean something. Ding, dang, darn it. And I don't mean that in the sense that the SCP Foundation uses it, meaning an anomaly that doesn't present an active threat to containment efforts. And more importantly, there aren't that many anomalies that are also delicious candy. And I want to eat this one. Sorry, 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 I lost my cool a bit there. I just have a sweet tooth and my brain is constantly drifting back to my nostalgic childhood memories of playing Candyland with my family. That was before they all decided that they wanted nothing to do with me because I became so obsessed with dressing up like a carnival barker that I drove away everyone who's ever cared about me. Other than that, my job here at the Foundation explaining confectionery SCPs is the only thing I have left in my sad, sad life. Some days I feel less like Gloppy and more like a real Lord Licorice. In hard times like these, a fellow could really use some entertainment to cheer himself up. Wait, just a flea jumping moment! What was that? What's the big idea? How did these escaped instances of SCP-3077-2 get in here? They're all supposed to be in safe containment a few floors down! Did somebody else from the research team let them in here because they knew I was in costume standing in front of a pretend fairground set? That's in pretty poor taste, don't you think? Pun very much intended. I should probably report it to the head researcher. That would be the ethical, reasonable thing to do. Then again, look at them go. Those are sure some hilarious dances. I'm definitely seeing a snappy attempt at doing the Charleston, a classic. And is that one doing the worm or is it just kind of flopping on the floor? I think one of these instances knows about that Fortnite stuff all the kids are into these days, but I'm not sure if the human element or the golem that decides what dances it knows. Either way, this was exactly what I needed to feel so much better. 
For once, it feels like I'm actually at a carnival instead of just pretending to be at one now. This is the greatest performance I've ever seen in all my years, which you can be sure that there have been a lot of. SCP-106 is like something out of a night terror. That gray, rotting flesh, those wide, empty eyes like those of a shark, that relentless corrosion and decay that follows him everywhere. But what if I told you that, beneath that horrifying exterior, was a heartbreaking, tragic backstory? Some of our more eagle-eyed viewers know that SCP-106 has a wide variety of potential origin stories, different events that may have led to the old man we all know and fear today. So this is just one of several hypothetical backstories. With that little caveat out of the way, it's time to see if we can bring a tear to your eye with the tragic tale of SCP-106. Back in the year 2000, Dr. Robert Scranton and his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, were head researchers at Site 120. The two of them shared a lot of things. A home, a life, a shared love of Bon Jovi songs. But one of the things they had in common was a passion for experimental research. The two worked together to develop a device called the Lang Scranton Stabilizer, which was an early prototype of the reality anchors used by the SCP Foundation to this day. During a round of routine tests, an earthquake unexpectedly struck Site-120. Dr. Scranton was working in Reality Lab A when the ground beneath him began to rumble. The LSS shook from the activity, components sliding out of place or breaking off altogether. By the time the guards and Dr. Lang arrived to inspect the scene, both Dr. Scranton and the LSS control panel were gone. Upon his disappearance, Dr. Scranton was initially presumed dead. However, five years, 11 months, and 21 days later, his whereabouts became clear. On December 23, 2005, the LSS control panel reappeared in Site-120's Reality Lab A. It was covered in unknown organic matter and reeked of vomit, blood, and death. As Dr. Anna Lang wandered into the area against the warnings of her colleagues, she was overwhelmed with grief and horror. She choked back tears as she accessed the control panel, retrieving the audio files left there, and realized that Dr. Scranton had been keeping a log of his time in whatever place the disaster had sent him. The husband she had lost had, in a way, come back to her, but she could not see him. She could hear his voice, but where was he? There was so much blood, so much unidentified organic matter. It looked like something had exploded onto the control panel, and she didn't want to think about what or who that could have been. As Robert's wedding ring fell to the floor, landing in the muck, the emotional strain became too much for Dr. Lang. She collapsed onto the ground, hitting her head on the pavement. Dr. Lang survived her fall, left only with a tender spot on her skull and a wealth of questions she was almost too afraid to answer. But she had to find out. With answers at her fingertips, she had to know what had become of her dear Robert. So with the help of the other Site-120 researchers who promised to step in when it became too painful, Dr. Lang began to go through the audio archives left behind by her lost love in the years since he had vanished. For the first eight days, Dr. Scranton didn't speak, at least not in any recognizable words. He hyperventilated, he muttered to himself, he sobbed, he screamed with pure rage and despair, but he didn't say any word. He paced around the new space, clawing for a way out, throwing his shoulder against any hard surface he could in an attempt to burst open a door, but he was trapped. On his eleventh day in the pocket dimension outside of any world he knew, Dr. Scranton began to speak. He reminded himself, reminded anyone who might someday listen, who he was. Robert Scranton, age 39, born September 19, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, living on a prayer. Wife, Anna. Every day, he repeated these simple truths, seeking comfort in his memories of Anna and the life they once shared. Her green eyes, their wedding day, her dressed in white shoving a piece of cake into his face with a giddy laugh and a sparkle in her eye. He hoped that she was okay, that she had managed to escape the chaos with her life, that she had been spared a similar fate. He repeated her nickname, the password he had set for the control panel, Anna Bobana. At this point, he realized that the machine was still recording. He called out for help, desperate to see if anyone could hear him. Is anyone there? Hello? A anyone? Anyone? 
But of course, there was no answer. Why the hell is this thing even working? It can't be working, he mused. What the hell? He couldn't see anything, not the switches or the knobs, only the blinking of the red recording light. He was growing hungrier and thirstier by the day, and though he knew he should be dead from dehydration by now, somehow he wasn't. He was still alive. Soon he found the controls, and determined he had been trapped in this place for two weeks, three days, 47 hours, and 58 minutes. He realized at this point that no matter how hungry he got, no matter how long he went without water, he would not die. Somehow in this place, his body kept going. His heart ticked along, far past what should have been his expiration date. He retrieved a small picture of Anna from his pocket, gazing at her face by the faint glow of the red light. Two months, four days, and three hours in, he recorded a formal message. My name is <clears throat> Robert Scranton. I'm a former head researcher of Site 120, a foundation facility dedicated to studying various reality-bending SCPs for the purpose of developing more advanced countermeasures towards such threats. For the last, red light speak to me. Two months, eight days, 16 hours, uh, what the red light said. I have been trapped in what I believe to be an empty pocket dimension. Alone. Yeah, alone. All alone. I'm calling this place SCP, um, I, I don't know. I can't even remember where we are. Screw it. I don't know what's happened in the past. Red light, please, again. Two months, eight days, 16 hours. But no one else is around to argue, and at this point, I'm just talking into this control panel to keep myself together. I... I need to keep a record. There might be some poor chap in the future who ends up like me, and if this eventually actually makes it out, maybe... Maybe I can help stop that from happening. It's all I have going for me right now, and I really need something to go for. <laughs> so, yeah. Robert Scranton. Documenting a new SCP for future research purposes. That'll have to do. Here we go. A few days later, he added to his informal SCP log. I don't know if we could contain wherever I am. It's definitely not on Earth. To be honest, I don't, I don't know where it is. I... I think it has something to do with the stabilizer prototype. I'll explain that more later. Um, okay, uh, yeah, wherever I am, I don't think it can be contained much as created. No, no, that's not the word. Um, entered, yeah, entered is better. I came into this place because of some really bad reality-bending accident. And no, no, Robert, don't be like that yet. Yeah, you don't know if there's no exit yet. Uh, <clears throat> this place, it's... Some sort of reality gap, I think. It's dark. <laughs> really dark. As in, this little red light that shows my words are actually being recorded is the only visible light in this entire place. I can't even see my hands and I can barely see the control panel here. I've had to basically use the light as a center and remember how many steps I take and in which direction. I haven't gone past a hundred yet. I'm, I'm too... too scared to. <laughs> I wonder if my hair is turning white right now. I can't even see what color it is anymore. Speaking of which, it, my head has been a bit itchy recently. If I don't concentrate on it, it's fine, but I feel this tingling all over my face. I'm not sure why. I, I just discovered a new property of this place. All this time I've been thinking I may be walking on some sort of flat ground, if you will. I keep eye contact with the little red light as far as I could see, and it seems I could walk in a straight, flat path. Jesus, my head is buzzing right now. I think the adrenaline is still kicking. But if if my hypothesis is correct, and this really is some sort of reality void, then there shouldn't be anything to walk on. Now that I think about it, the whole time I've been here, it felt like I'm walking, but also I'm uh, swimming through something. It's like I'm walking through really thick black gel. There's enough tension to keep me on a surface, but... If I imagine myself pressing down hard enough, I, I can descend. Wait, 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 wait. I, I think I need to test this more. I'll be back. Two months, 17 days, two hours. Navigation is largely affected by conscious impulses to travel in a certain direction. So this definitely isn't a complete reality gap, at least according to mine and honest theories. If it were, I wouldn't be able to move at all since space wouldn't have existed. Okay. Okay. This makes a lot more sense than it did before. Great. Great job, Robert. Okay, you're getting there. Come to think of it, I should have realized that sooner 
When I was able to move in a flat plane to and from the Little Red, it also explains why I'm not dead from dehydration or hunger yet. And time barely passes in here. Okay. Yeah, so I stood right next to Little Red and went straight down. Okay, from here on out, imagine Little Red as the origin of a 3D space. I went, um, down. Yeah, right. And then, and then I was able to come back up to Little Red again. I've also been able to fly above Red. Movement in here is slow, like I said, gel analogy, but best I can describe it. As Robert became more and more familiar with his surroundings, with the truth of where he found himself, something became clear. Of all the things in this new reality, he and his little red light were the realest. With time, they would begin to degrade, to fall apart. He had an estimation three years before he would be gone for good. He had to try and look for an end to this place, a way out. What did he have to lose? As it turned out, what he had to lose was himself. He couldn't feel his legs anymore, couldn't keep a grip on his own body. He ran in one straight line for six months, but found no edge, no end in sight. He went down for eight months straight and never hit bottom. His sole companion was the little red light, and he continued to talk to it as if it could ever answer. His hands began to phase into each other, the integrity of his form beginning to fade and warp. No matter what happened to him, he could not die. His sanity began to crumble, his voice breaking into uncontrollable sobs and hysterical laughter. Whoever Robert Scranton had been, he was gone. He was something else now, and who knew how long that new thing would last. For the next 25 years, Dr. Anna Lang tried her best to put the thought of her lost husband out of her head. It almost worked some days. She almost forgot that hole in her heart. Then, one fateful day, Site-120 received a deadly visitor. SCP-106 reached through the back wall of her lab, dripping its horrible rot all over the floor. It grabbed for her, its touch melting her lab coat as she tore away from its toothless grin, the singular focus in its milky eyes. The old man chased her down, pushing past a guard's bullets, tearing through everything in its path. She had done enough work on dimensional anomalies to recognize one when she saw it, and this was one of the most destructive she had ever encountered. When it finally caught her, it said one word. Red. Then another, one that made her eyes fill with tears. Anna. Dr. Robert Scranton had found a way to escape the dead-end prison he had fallen into, that gap between worlds. All it had taken was giving up his humanity, letting that world rearrange his atoms and make him something monstrous, something that destroyed all it touched. He couldn't remember why he needed to find Anna, how he had been separated from her for so long. He could only remember that he wanted her, wanted to be with her, wanted to touch her again, even as she screamed and melted in her hands. SCP-106 was once a man, just like any other man. What he is now shares that vague shape of the human he used to be, the vaguest hints of his memories, but that is where the similarities end. Like the rotting flesh of his body might suggest, he is little more than a shambling corpse with a ravenous appetite for violence. Dr. Robert Scranton is dead, but he will never rest. Imagine you were out in public and you found yourself injured. Maybe you were in an accident and couldn't move, or someone had mugged you, and in the ensuing scuffle, you'd ended up getting hurt. Laying on the cold, filthy concrete of the sidewalk in desperate need of help, what could be the one thing that might make you feel even the slightest bit better? Something the very sight of would be enough to tell you everything was going to be okay. The flashing lights drawing closer accompanied by the sound of tires on the road and a wailing siren. All signs that an ambulance is on its way. But what if the ambulance that came to assist you ended up making you feel far worse than you were before and leaving you with injuries unlike anything you'd ever seen? What if it wasn't an ambulance at all that came to help you? What if you were found by SCP-4419 instead? Jeremy had been having a somewhat normal day until his accident. Work had been another shift of long, arduous hours spent behind his desk. Five o'clock finally rolled around. He grabbed his bag and punched out. If he'd maybe left a few minutes later, he might have gotten away unscathed. Instead of getting caught in the mad rush of people leaving work, Jeremy usually took the back streets and avoided main roads as a shortcut to get home. There was less traffic, even during the rush, and that made crossing the streets safer, usually. 
He had been looking the other way when a car came speeding down the mostly empty side street. The driver had slammed the brakes, but only too late, knocking Jeremy down. Winded, he collapsed, unable to stand as the force of the impact had broken his leg. The driver and a few nearby onlookers huddled around Jeremy as he lay there with his injury. Suddenly, the noise of an ambulance caused the other pedestrians to mostly disperse, still trying to catch his breath. In the last moments of his fading consciousness, the last thing he remembered seeing were a pair of figures. They had jostled rather aggressively through the crowd, reaching down to lift Jeremy up and shoved him into the emergency vehicle. They were considerably rude for medical professionals. Nobody around wanted to argue with them. Most would even go so far as to call them hostile. But that was nothing compared to the horror that awaited him when he reopened his eyes, laying back on the road where he'd been found. His body had been rearranged. He barely recognized it as his own. It was like he had been turned into some grotesque animal made using human parts. His arms and legs had been rearranged to protrude from his torso in an unnatural configuration. What felt even worse was that his fingers, toes, hands, feet, they all still worked. All Jeremy could do was scream until he slipped back under. A man turned into something else entirely. Bad days can happen to the best and worst of us, and sometimes those bad days can spiral into very, very bad nights. Mike had been having a night like that. Earlier that day, he'd lost a fair sum of money at the races. Gambling was one of his many vices, as was alcohol, and to commiserate his loss, Mike had hit the bar. Unfortunately, his already foul mood was nudged into full-blown temper when another patron accidentally bumped into him. The ensuing bar fight was a complete, disoriented, drunken mess of glasses being smashed and fists thrown. One managed to connect hard with Mike's jaw, breaking it and leaving him sat on the sidewalk in pain. Cop cars had shown up, officers breaking up the ruckus and paramedics arriving to treat the more badly injured patrons. It was then that two paramedics silently walked up to Mike and grabbed him by both arms. As much as he tried to pull away from their forceful grip, his arms were covered in bruises and cuts from the glass. Their fingers dug in, honing in on those painful, wounded spots so that Mike could really feel his own injuries as they pulled him up against his will. Trying to verbally protest only hurt his jaw further, meaning he could barely call for help as he was bundled into the back of an ambulance, doors slamming shut behind him. The next morning introduced Mike to a whole new and far grislier definition of the word hangover. One of the staff who worked at the bar found him, just waiting outside when she came up to open for business a few days later. Sitting out front, Mike had been left in the gutter, although it took the bartender a moment to notice just what was wrong with him, and when she saw it in full, she screamed. Instead of Mike's jaw being fixed, it had been wrenched open, far wider than natural. It was locked in a permanent, gaping expression, the sides of his lips sporting splits that ran all the way into his cheeks. Lodged between both rows of Mike's teeth, fused to his gums, was a piece of glass, too thick for him to break to free his jaw or even bite down on. A mouthful of glass shards and blood, cuts lining the inside of his cheeks, fragments lodged inside his tongue. All of that might have been preferable, a mercy compared to what actually happened. The glass was keeping his mouth stretched out, stopping him from speaking like a transparent gag. And as if not being able to speak or beg for help wasn't bad enough, anyone that looked through that little window was also offered a whole other horrific view. They could see Mike's heart. It had been pulled from his chest and reattached at the back of his throat, still beating as tears rolled down his face. He couldn't eat, talk, only breathe through his nose, and it hurt. Reg and Lee had vowed when they first got married to love each other for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, until death did they part. And death very nearly almost parted them. If given the choice between dying together or suffering through what ended up being done to them, not even their love for each other would have made them want to stay alive. The rain was beating down on the windshield as the couple drove home in silence. They'd had a big argument. In fact, it was small in the grand scheme of their relationship, just a lover's quarrel. In that moment, though, it felt like the biggest problem in the world, as those types of squabbles often do. 
but it would have seemed quaint compared to the fate that awaited both Lee and her husband that night. Visibility was poor. The headlights were doing little to help Reg see through the downpour or the dark. He found it so hard to see that he almost missed their turn, quickly wrenching the steering wheel to try and correct the mistake. Reg lost control of the car as it slid on the slippery road, flipping sideways and rolling as the rain continued to pour. The airbags deployed. The force of being thrown around even with her seatbelt on caused Lee to suffer a number of broken ribs. Meanwhile, Reg's arm was broken when the driver's side door connected with the ground and dented inwards. As the couple were left buckled in their seats, upside down and both crying at the pain of their injuries, they spotted the unmistakable silhouette of an ambulance driving through the rain towards them. They were both so relieved that neither one of them realized they hadn't called the emergency number yet. Although the rain had long since stopped by the time Lee woke back up, the storm was just beginning. Her head was spinning. Everything was sore and aching. She had expected to be in a hospital, maybe with Reg in her bed beside her, both of them recovering but alive at least. Pushing herself up by her cut bloody hands, Lee could feel something heavy behind her, a weight on her back, like having a rucksack strapped to her, only it was harder to move, almost the same mass as a person. Slowly looking over her shoulder, Lee screamed when she saw the flesh of her back had been fused to Reg's, their skin melted and stuck together like candle wax, each of them unable to pull away without the pain of feeling like they were being ripped apart. To make matters worse, Lee had undergone other modifications. Talk about in sickness or health. Living alone, Rodney was relatively content with his life. Since retiring, he'd been able to spend his twilight years appreciating the little things, spending most of his time out in the garden, tending to his flowers, and occasionally enjoying the company of his adult son. Unfortunately, with old age comes the increased risk of health problems, and to say Rodney had himself more than his fair share of heart difficulties, or a bum ticker as he called it, was an understatement. While out in his garden, Rodney suffered a violent heart attack and collapsed, wheezing and struggling to breathe. Luckily, his son Keith was in the house at the time. He witnessed his elderly father drop to the ground and ran out to help him, calling for an ambulance as he tried to calm Rodney down. The emergency services seemed to arrive much quicker than Keith had been expecting, a pair of paramedics rushing through the house to lift his dad away. What struck him as strange was neither one would tell Keith which hospital they were taking his dad to, and they outright refused to let him ride in the back of the ambulance to keep Rodney lucid, and reassure him that he was in safe hands. When Keith went to climb into the back, one of the paramedics pushed him by the chest with enough strength to knock him over. As he pulled himself off the concrete, the rear door slammed shut and the ambulance sped away to God knows where with Rodney in the back. After a few days of hearing nothing, Keith had already tirelessly been calling every hospital in the area to ask if his dad had been admitted. None of them had seen Rodney, and his worried son had just been about to call the police to file a missing persons report when his elderly father appeared on the doorstep. Immediately, Keith drove his dad to the emergency room, trying to explain what had happened with the strange ambulance. While the hospital maintained that it wasn't one of theirs, they admitted Rodney and gave him a full examination, only to find something that would turn the stomachs of the world's most seasoned doctors. Rodney had more than one heart. Someone had given him not just a spare, but 11 additional hearts. They were stuffed between his natural organs, like too many books squeezed together on a shelf, and not one of them was beating. They were causing far more harm than good. Rodney's insides were riddled with these foreign bodies that were stopping his lungs from fully inflating, resting on his stomach, and wrecking havoc with his bodily functions. Upon discovery of these extra hearts, Rodney was rushed into the operating theater, with his son nervously pacing in the corridor outside. Sadly, a doctor would soon appear to tell Keith that the moment the surgeons removed one of the additional hearts, Rodney's old bum ticker had finally given out. Sometimes as sad as it may be to reconcile with, tragedy strikes. One night, a fire broke out in a crowded bar, leading to a whole host of people suffering severe burns and requiring urgent medical attention. What they received instead was far more brutal and barbaric. Joyce had been in the bar when the alarm started to ring. Nobody knew what had started it, only that they needed to evacuate. But it didn't take the flames long to reach the alcohol behind the bar, 
and before long the whole place was ablaze, everyone panicking and barging past each other to get out. Once free of the searing heat, swapping it for the biting cold of the night air, the commotion didn't seem to end. Someone near her pointed to an ambulance that had just arrived, and a duo of paramedics that were manhandling some of the more badly burned bar patrons, forcing them into the back of their vehicle. Along with about six others, Joyce marched up as the group protested how the injured drinkers were being treated. When the paramedics refused to stop, things got uglier. The ensuing brawl left Joyce and the other six people with skull fractures, but rather than just leave them behind, the paramedics grabbed them too. Joyce was pushed into an already overcrowded ambulance. There were 26 people crammed in their total, including her. 19 of them had nasty burns on their skin, wounds that were only made worse by being packed together in such a tight space and jostled around as the ambulance drove away. There were no sign of the missing 26 bar patrons for around a week. The families of those that had disappeared after the fire urged the police to keep searching for them, with no bodies recovered at the scene by firefighters. Nobody had a clue where the group had gone. Joyce's partner, Al, even printed off missing flyers and handed them out to anyone who would take them. They also happened to be the caretaker of a local community center, and after another day of worrying tirelessly about Joyce, Al moped back there to clean and lock the place up. What they found waiting for them was like something out of an old horror B-movie or something found in the deepest parts of the ocean. Filling one of the rooms of the community center was a huge, watery mass. It wasn't pure liquid, although Al first mistook it as the result of a leaking pipe. The mass was fluid. It twitched and shivered whenever they reached out to touch it, almost like a living thing, or what was left of a few living things. Say, 26 bar patrons melted down and reduced to a collective liquid mass. Now, you'd think having an accident out in public would be as bad as things got, but that's nothing compared to being injured in the line of duty right in the middle of a war zone. That's what happened to Private Jackson. While he and his squad were out on a routine patrol in Afghanistan, a group of enemy insurgents ambushed the United States' soldiers. During the ensuing firefight, Private Jackson sustained a severe gunshot wound, leaving him bleeding out. His comrades had called for a medical evacuation and were expecting a U.S. Army helicopter to arrive at any moment. What none of them had expected was a city ambulance driving towards them across the battlefield as if it was the most normal sight on Earth. Already suspicious of the approaching vehicle, Private Jackson's fellow teammates raised their weapons at the approaching paramedics. Despite the soldiers' demands for them to identify themselves, neither one of the ambulance attendants seemed to pay them much mind, grabbing Private Jackson and dragging the wounded soldier towards the vehicle. He called to the rest of his squad wanting to be let go, having no idea where he was about to be taken or why. The commanding officer barked at the pair of EMTs, warning if they didn't release Private Jackson, then his men would open fire. Still, the paramedics didn't seem to be listening. Just as they threw Jackson into their ambulance and climbed into the cab at the front, the other soldiers opened fire. Squeezing their triggers, bullets were spat from their weapons, riddling the metal sides of the vehicle as it began to drive away, siren blaring and lights flashing. Every shot that connected with the ambulance seemed to cause it to leak a viscous black fluid, like an oil. But despite this, it did little to deter the ambulance from driving away with Jackson captive in the back. After being successfully extracted from the battlefield, the remainder of the squad were airlifted back to safety, arriving back at their nearby base the following day. Each one of them were solemnly silent. All of them were confused as to how an ambulance had even appeared in the desert out of nowhere and disappeared without a trace. But even more so, they were concerned for the life of their kidnapped comrade. However, they wouldn't have to wait long, as arriving at their barracks revealed the grim, grotesque fate of Private Johnson. He was on the walls, as in, all over the walls. His body had been dissolved somehow, broken down into little more than a thin, bloody paste that had now been smeared over the interior of the barracks. Looking out at his former squad from the liquefied remains was a single human eyeball, Private Jackson's eye, wide with horror, at what had been done to him. SCP-4419, known to some by the nickname of the Butcher's Chariot, is still out there. At present, it is unknown who, or indeed what, performs the horrific mutilations on its victims, or even why. It could be that SCP-4419, if it has a consciousness, could be trying to help those it abducts, but lacks the correct medical understanding of how to do so. 
Then again, it could simply just be cruel, torturing and deforming people unfortunate enough to need emergency medical attention. Given how sporadically this anomalous ambulance can appear and disappear, at the site of any medical emergency anywhere on the planet, there's little the Foundation can do other than stay vigilant and pick up SCP-4419's patients after it has mutilated them. Or rather, they can pick up whatever's left of their victims. Can a thought be infectious? Is it possible that transferring an idea can happen as easily as catching the common cold? Someone gets it, then transmits it to another person who then passes it on to someone else and so on. Imagine for a moment that information is a disease. We can't see information or feel it. We can read it in books or on the internet, but actually seeing it or feeling it inside our heads is impossible. So what if something could taint the information we absorb? Use it to slip its way undetected into your mind then pass from you to your friends, your family, your co-workers. How would you know it was there? And how could you prevent it from getting into your head? Perhaps it's time you were introduced to SCP-3002. Over its many years of studying and containing anomalous beings and entities, the SCP Foundation has encountered a number of creatures with memetic abilities. If you are unfamiliar with the term, memetic usually refers to data or information that has been manipulated in order to influence or subconsciously change a person's behavior. This can take any form, from text and images to spoken phrases and other audio. For example, a form of memetic influence we have all experienced at some point is product placement. If you ever watched a character in a movie or on TV using a certain product, then that may have made you decide that you want to buy that same product for yourself. That idea was planted in your head by something you saw and had a subliminal influence on your behavior. SCP-3002 is one such entity that uses mimetic stimuli for its own nefarious purposes. Some anomalies, like SCP-2440, use mimetic information to spread knowledge of themselves among human beings, getting stronger the more people learn about it. SCP-3002, on the other hand, is information. This entity is a thought, a living, sentient thought, with a number of abilities that allow it to influence the minds of human beings. It is hard to picture a thought, let alone one that is alive. Since we can't see information, the idea of something so abstract having a tangible form boggles the mind. SCP-3002 is capable of shape-shifting, and while it does not possess its own consistent shape, the entity is able to transform itself into the form of any piece of information it chooses. Existing as pure information means that it is intangible to any beings that possess physical bodies. But what makes SCP-3002 a threat to everyone at the Foundation and earn this entity its Keter classification is its power to manipulate a person's mind or memories allowing SCP-3002 to directly enter human minds. Moving at the speed that thoughts can travel through the brain, this entity is almost impossible to kill or kept contained. SCP-3002 can spread like a sickness through a human population, attacking new minds and taking control of its victims. According to the Foundation's research, there is only one way to remove the influence of SCP-3002. Anyone that comes under the control of this entity has to undergo complex, intricate, and risky brain surgery in order to physically remove the entity from their minds. However, the Foundation considers this method to be impractical, time-consuming, cost and effective, and is rendered utterly pointless if SCP-3002 has infected too much of a subject's mind. So instead, in order to prevent the spread of SCP-3002's influence, all Foundation personnel are instructed to terminate any person contaminated by this living thought. This order is extended to that individual's family, friends, colleagues, and even acquaintances. Given that SCP-3002 can take the form of any information it chooses, written words, a sound, even a telepathic signal, Anyone even remotely linked to someone the entity infects has to be destroyed to stop any potential spread. If you or anyone you knew were to come into contact with SCP-3002, the entity would be able to take control of your entire consciousness. All your memories would be ripe for the entity's picking. 
SCP-3002 is able to sift through your temporal lobe where memories are stored, and can not only destroy and delete an infected person's memories, but can also create false memories to replace them. And all the while, you would be completely unaware that this was happening to you. Stripped of all your natural survival instincts while SCP-3002 runs riot in your brain. There is currently no known limit to how much of someone's mind SCP-3002 is able to mimic, rewrite, alter, or remove. When the entity alters one of your memories, that memory will become an additional instance of SCP-3002. In other words, it can implant itself in every moment of your life, making itself a part of everything you remember about your own personal past and even the parts you can't. Once SCP-3002 has spread itself to every piece of information stored inside your brain, the next stage of infection begins, and SCP-3002 is able to take full control of a person's body. Much like before, this could be happening to you without you ever being consciously aware of it. Usually this doesn't come to much, and infected victims will carry on their day-to-day -day lives, acting no different to how they would normally. That is, until SCP-3002 detects a new target that hasn't been infected yet. When this happens, any people previously exposed to SCP-3002 will collectively seek out the uncontaminated individual capturing them. Once this happens, SCP-3002's infected army will force their new victim to join them. The SCP Foundation considers SCP-3002 to be extremely hostile and a major threat to their organization and the world at large. Due to SCP-3002 being uncontainable and able to infinitely adapt, it has evaded capture or termination for a considerable length of time. Having the ability to spread among human beings via the information we share with each other – speech, texts, emails, phone calls, any information at all – means that potentially any and all information could contain SCP-3002. According to calculations of the Foundation's top researchers, 78% of humanity may be under the influence of SCP-3002 without any awareness that they have been infected. While dangerous and unstoppable, SCP-3002 doesn't operate purely on instinct. It doesn't infect as many minds as it can just because it knows no other way. Everything that SCP-3002 does is a premeditated, calculated decision with one nefarious intention. One goal. To destroy the SCP Foundation from the inside out by killing or infecting every member of personnel. Believe it or not, SCP-3002 didn't begin life as a sentient infectious thought. In fact, SCP-3002 was once a person, a regular human being like you or I. She even had a name, Lily Veselka. It is widely believed that Lily Veselka became what we now know as SCP-3002 due to the actions of the Foundation itself. Since becoming SCP-3002, Lily seems to have been searching for any information she can find regarding a highly secret operation conducted by the SCP Foundation known as Project Lethe. As well as this, she appears to have an interest in a number of Foundation research facilities, including Site E and an off-the-books facility located in Ukraine's Yusaninskyi National Park. This is potentially where SCP-3002 was first created. If any of this is to be believed, then it would certainly explain SCP-3002's noticeable aggression towards the Foundation, and its attempts to infect its personnel as an act of revenge. After the project that turned Lily into a living thought, SCP-3002 was later encountered by the Foundation in its current form in South Rock Penitentiary. This prison, located near Lafayette, Indiana, was first visited by one Dr. Daryl Lloyd, one of the SCP Foundation's researchers. The prison psychiatrist, a woman named Dr. Suzanne Fairbank, was the first to notice the effects of SCP-3002 contamination on a number of South Rock Penitentiary's inmates. During sessions with her, several of these prisoners had mentioned an identical memory to Dr. Fairbank. The description of the memory from each of the inmates followed the same structure. The prisoner remembered taking a long walk through a forest with their best friend at the time. This detail, the best friend, is most likely SCP-3002 herself, imitating a figure from each inmate's own childhood memories. At some point in this false shared memory, all the prisoners recalled having an argument with their friend. It was later learned that the figure was Lily Veselka, 
approaching infected individuals in their memories to ask them questions about the project that had turned her into SCP-3002, often demanding to know, what do you know about me, or has the project finished? The Foundation began to investigate this bizarre instance of shared anomalous memory after Dr. Suzanne Fairbank shared her findings on an internet message board, describing what she had witnessed to other psychology experts. At first, Dr. Lloyd, the Foundation's researcher sent to South Rock to gather more information, labeled the situation as low-priority research. Given SCP-3002's ability to adapt and take the form of any information, it was able to avoid immediate detection by the SCP Foundation and the full extent of Lily's abilities remained hidden. Dr. Lloyd originally classified SCP-3002 as safe, believing it was a little more than a shared childhood memory that the South Rock inmates had described. At first, those that had been infected with this collective memory were able to recount it with perfect accuracy. But as Dr. Lloyd continued to interview and test the affected inmates, the details became scarier and the memory became less and less defined the further the SCP Foundation looked into it. Perhaps Lily recognized the Foundation's presence and remembered that they were the ones responsible for turning her into a sentient mimetic entity without physical form and started hiding her tracks. Maybe she was biding herself time, hiding herself away in the minds of the infected prisoners until the time was right. Little did Dr. Lloyd realize at the time just how far SCP-3002's influence had already spread. Lily wasn't just in the inmates' heads, but almost all of the prison staff, too, who were now spreading her further and further without even realizing it. Thinking that SCP-3002 would be easy to contain, Dr. Lloyd had the Foundation administer amnestics to all the infected inmates. Amnestics are memory-altering drugs that the SCP Foundation uses to prevent any information about SCPs becoming known to the public. When dealing with mimetic anomalies like SCP-3002 or SCP-2440, amnestics can be particularly useful in removing a person's memories about a mimetic SCP. Dr. Lloyd hoped that this would be the case at South Rock, still thinking SCP-3002 was nothing more than an anomalous shared memory that could be removed. However, removing the false memory that Lily had implanted in the prisoners would not remove her from all their other memories. Additionally, one of the infected inmates was not given amnestics and was brought back to the Foundation for observation. From there, SCP-3002's influence had been able to spread like a sickness through the ranks of the Foundation's own personnel, without their knowledge or detection. Every person whose mind SCP-3002 is able to reach becomes an unwitting carrier for the infectious living thought. It is unknown exactly how many of the SCP Foundation's members are under the control of SCP-3002, granting Lily access to the wealth of secret information and plans that the Foundation keeps hidden. It doesn't matter what level of clearance someone would need to view it. If it's information, it's another way for SCP-3002 to spread. And information, as we know, can take any form, be it a written file, a spoken conversation, or even an informative YouTube video. Now tell me again about the time that we took a walk together in the forest. Okay guys, so to wrap this video up, I really don't think this cursed episode of this show was real. It's obviously just a really good scary fan animation, and the fact that the creators behind it didn't come out and claim ownership of it sooner, allowing it to be reposted and re-uploaded so many times, is really what got people thinking was legit. That being said, it's still a good attempt at what a cursed lost episode would look like, so shout out to those animators, man. Anyway, I've been the Goat Hellholder 98 be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel down below, and hey, if you know about any more lost media you want me to cover, leave it in the comments and I'll check it out. Now be sure to follow my socials at hellholder98, I go live most days and post updates about new videos on my story, so go check it out. Alright, until then, I'll see you somewhere down the line. The moment his finger pushed the button to stop the camera recording, the practiced false smile dropped from Holden's face. It was hard not to feel down after he'd finished filming a new video, not thanks to any post-creativity slump, but the more depressing knowledge of just how much of an uphill battle this whole thing was. It felt like yesterday when Holden had first gotten into the creepier side of the internet. He never ventured into anything illicit or outright illegal, mind you. But there was a distinct corner of the web that had pulled him in when he was still at school and just starting to spend more time online. This part of the internet was filled with scary stories that were mostly fake or made up for likes, but that could have been real. There were unsettling animations, 
short clips that were hand-drawn to give people the creeps and keep them up at night. Not to mention a whole archive of public safety announcement videos, terrifying workplace and road safety warnings that used to be broadcast on TV and were as petrifying than the most acclaimed horror movies. Speaking of things that were broadcast to TV, that had gradually become Holden's specialty. One of his friends had sent him the link to a fictional account of someone who had supposedly uncovered an unaired episode of a Saturday morning kids cartoon, or so this person claimed anyway. They went on to describe bizarre imagery, so intense and terrifying that it was unbefitting of a show for children. Then, the person who made the original post explained how they got into contact with the show's creators via email to ask them about this cursed episode. The showrunner responded stating that the episode the poster had allegedly seen didn't even exist. To Holden, it didn't matter if the story was real or not. That wasn't the point. What was far more important was that it felt real. To him, it was plausible, even possible, that there were pieces of media out there in the world that had never seen the light of day. Episodes of TV shows or entire movies that were so wild and out there that they could have been banned and buried long before the dawn of the internet, wherein there was a record of everything and nothing was ever really lost. The idea of uncovering those lost pieces of media became Holden's primary hobby. He'd come home from school, throw his backpack onto his bed, and then sit in front of his computer for hours without even changing out of the clothes he had been wearing all day in class. But all the time he spent trawling through forum threads, following and messaging collectors on social media, listening to theories and coming up with his own, eventually it began to encroach on other things. Much to his mom's disappointment, Holden's grades took a rapid decline, and it wasn't long before he was failing his classes bad enough to not make the cut to continue on at school. But as much as it upset his mother, Holden really didn't mind. He was already thinking way beyond high school, and he knew he didn't need grades to be able to do the one thing he wanted to do with his life. Holden set up his own channel, with the plan to start uploading videos under his new online alter ego. And before long, Hellholder98 was born. He centered his whole internet persona around lost media, discussing which popular rumors were true and which were fictionalized for likes and clicks. It started out with a few discussion videos, where he would simply sit in his bedroom, a camcorder opposite him as he spoke. But before long, Holden was adding more and more flair to his content, learning how to edit on his computer, adding clips or screenshots he could find of supposed lost TV episodes to give his videos some credibility, a very necessary quality when trying to determine if certain things were real or not. Each video he finished, he had another two topics to a list of ideas he kept, planning to just perpetually churn out content until he eventually had a huge hit that went viral. Although the one thing he didn't realize until it was perhaps too late was that social media success didn't happen overnight. In fact, it didn't happen over many, many nights either. No matter how often Holden promoted his channel on his social media profiles, or how many new videos he uploaded, he couldn't seem to get any to land well and get boosted by the algorithm. At least that's one of the things he attributed the problem to. He pointed the finger of blame at anything that he could. One day, it was that the algorithm was suppressing his channel and boosting others who had already got more subscribers. The next, it might be his slow internet connection had led to one of his videos going live at a time when the site had low traffic. The one possibility that Holden didn't stop to consider was that maybe his genre of content was too niche, but that the days of the internet's interest in lost media had already peaked back when he was still in high school. Nevertheless, he kept trying, making content day in and day out working under the assumption that, if he just made enough videos, then one day he was sure to blow up. That would be his big break, his ultimate win, a video that did well enough to garner thousands, if not millions, of views. But the more time he devoted to Hellholder 98, the only number that seemed to be at all increasing was the number of videos he had posted, each one barely garnering view figures that were above a single digit. To make matters worse, getting help with growing his online brand was next to impossible. Every now and then, he would post on forums asking for advice, or if anyone wanted to collaborate so he could gain some exposure from creators with bigger followings. Those posts were often met with a slew of apathetic, snide responses, or comments telling Holden to just, quote, make better content, as if that was solid, specific advice. On top of that, his mom had outright refused to support her son's chosen career path, 
citing his failure at school as the main reason. Speaking of, any friends Holden previously had at school had all moved away in the years since, going off to pursue college and other higher education. Some were even starting their new and exciting professions. The old saying said, it's lonely at the top, but Holden was just as lonely down at the bottom, posting his content in total obscurity, as if he was just shouting into an empty void with no one around to hear. The few people Holden did still consider his friends were all as chronically online as he was. Most of them fellow lost media collectors. After interacting with them in the common threads of various forums, the handful of like-minded guys were as close as Holden had to people actively supporting his channel. The collectors would usually give him pointers or topics to discuss in videos and contributing to the single-digit view count underneath his uploads. Although to him, it wasn't nearly enough. He didn't want just his friends to see his videos. He wanted an audience, a fan base of his own. It was late, the light of the computer monitor illuminating the dark of Holden's bedroom. Hunched over his desk, he was clicking and dragging clips into the timeline of a video project, trimming them down to make the whole thing better paced, snipping out bad takes where he stumbled over his words or misspoke. It was while editing that Holden noticed another screen lighting up on his desk, accompanied by a vibration, his phone. He reached for it, seeing a notification popped up on the lock screen. It was from Goth, one of the lost media collectors, and it read, Dude, urgent, found something that you can make a video on. Holden sighed. It was late, and he was already focused on editing this current video tonight. If he got it finished, then he could go to sleep. What do you know about the Deathly videotape? Goth asked in a second message, before Holden even had a chance to open it first. The what? He replied bluntly, before sending another text saying, Can't this wait until the morning? I'm trying to edit. If you don't act fast, it'll be gone forever, came the response only a second later, followed by a link. Lethargically, Holden tapped the hyperlink Goth had sent, his phone opening up its browser and displaying the web page. It was a buy and sell website. One of those places where people offloaded junk they didn't want anymore to strangers for a bit of extra cash. The page in question showed a few grainy photos taken on a phone of a small rectangular object in someone's hand. What is that? Holden asked. It's a videotape, bonehead, Goth fired back. Although they'd never met in person, Holden always got the sense his friend was a little older than he was. Looking back on the seller's ad, it was for a second-hand Sony Color Collection 60-90 to minute mini-DV videotape, a type of cassette used in a lot of old handheld recording cameras. So what? Holden asked in another text. Look, there have been rumors for ages about something called the Deathly Videotape. Goth replied in a series of rapid-fire messages. It used to be all the rage on a lot of old lost media forums, the real nasty ones before they got shut down. Supposedly, there's a recording on this tape of some kind of live show. Except when you put in your VCR and press play, you see something horrible. Nobody even knows if it's real or just a legend. How do you know this is the same tape? Holden queried. By now, he had typed out the same link on his computer and was looking at the for sale page on the bigger screen while he texted back and forth with Goth. Read the item description, he answered. Holden's eyes scanned down the page, finding a short message from the seller. To anyone interested, I'm giving this old mini DV tape away. I don't know where I got it or why I watched it, but I wish I hadn't. It had ruined everything for me. It's impossible to enjoy anything else now that I've seen what's on it. Let me make this clear, I am not selling this tape, I'm giving it away free of charge. I hope that getting rid of it will help. Sounds ominous, Holden texted. If you're so sure if this is the Deathly videotape, then why don't you get it? Keep reading, Goth responded. Underneath the item description was another note that the seller had written. Please note, I am unable to leave my town at present, nor can I mail this tape to anyone even if you pay postage. Collection only. If you're interested, please contact me at the following address. Below was an address. It was in Holden's hometown, only a few streets away from where he and his mom lived. This could be it, dude. Came another slew of messages from Goth. You buy this tape and make a video recording, then you might finally go viral. But you better be quick before someone goes and picks it up thinking it's just an ordinary tape. Holden looks back at the address, double-checking where it was. At most, it'd take a quick walk there and back, he thought. And if this tape was as elusive as Goth said it was, then owning it would mean Holden would be the only one who could make a video featuring it. After messaging the seller the night before, Holden found himself rushing through his quiet neighborhood to the address. All night as he tried to sleep, he kept thinking of the video he was going to make, how it could finally put him on the map, and at long last, bring him the e-fame he'd been working towards. Wrapping his knuckles against the front door, he was met by an older man who stood on the other side. 
He was walking with a crutch, with a few bruises and stitched up cuts on his face. The second that Holden explained he was there for the tape, the man reached to an unseen shelf just inside the doorframe and thrust the rectangular cassette into his hands before shutting the door as quickly as he could without it hitting Holden square in the face. He stared at the tape in his hands, though through its transparent green plastic case, he could see a hand-scrawled note. I know you'll ignore me if I tell you not to watch this, it read. So if you do, then on your own head be it. Having spent the rest of the day looking up exactly what he'd need to play such an old, outmoded recording format and convert the footage to digital so he could include it in his video, Holden had retrieved his mom's old VHS player from the attic, wiping the thick layer of dust off of it. It took a while for him to get everything ready to go, not just finding the right adapters and cables to hook the VCR up to his TV, as well as linking that to his computer, plus angling his camera right, and making sure the ring light he'd bought for filming was putting enough focus on his face. After the substantial prep, Holden took a deep breath, summoning up the faux excitement and stage smile, before he hit the record button on his camera. What's up guys, it's Hellholder98 here. Now today I've got a real treat for you all. So my friend Goth, shout out to him, told me that a while ago, there was talk about something called the Deathly Videotape. We found a mini DV tape that we think might be that very same tape, so we're gonna watch it and see if it's legit. Dropping his persona as his face turned away from the camera, Holden punched the play button on the VHS player. His eyes glued to the TV screen as the camera's lens was fixated on him. Okay, nothing so far, he observed, met with nothing but a blank, black screen. Suddenly, after 12 seconds of nothing, the playback started instantly, and Holden started relaying what he was seeing on the tape to the camera. There was no sound, either because the recording on the videotape was filmed in that way, or Holden had improperly figured out how to hook it up to the VHS. The video itself showed a recording of Sesame Street Live, and for the most part just seemed pretty underwhelming. Characters were up on stage, their puppeteers managing to stay out of sight as they entertained their young audience. After two and a half minutes, Holden was starting to feel like he'd gone to all this effort over what seemed to just be someone's old, unwanted home video. Just as he was considering turning off the camera and throwing the videotape in the trash, at almost the three minute mark, something weird started happening on the stage. The actor playing one of the bigger characters seemed to be having some trouble, instantly trying to pull off his cumbersome costume, much to the distress of the kids in the audience looking on in horror. But it wasn't just the illusion that had been broken. The actor was trying to get out of his costume because he was choking. He dropped to his knees on stage, clawing at his own throat before finally falling face down, totally still, asphyxiated, dead. Over the next almost 20 seconds, the same thing started happening to another three of the characters on stage all of them violently choking while the children in the audience screamed and cried silently on the inaudible tape. Then, at three and a half minutes, the video cut out. Holden was unsure how to react, at first a little creeped out, only to be somewhat bemused. He played it down for the camera, remarking that the video seemed tame compared to some of the more graphic fake content he'd seen. But the whole time, even after rapping, recording, sitting awake all night to edit his reaction video, blurring out the parts that would break the terms of service, he had no idea what he'd seen was actually real or not. Finishing the final edit just as the sun was coming up, Holden hit upload and crawled into bed while his video was uploaded. The buzz of a text message from Goth awoke him. Dude, I told you this video was going to make it big. Without even replying, Holden booted up his computer and opened the page for his newly uploaded video. The view count was already in the thousands and climbing, comments pouring in underneath, mostly from people debating whether or not the contents of the tape had been faked. Holden punched the air in excitement. He'd finally done it. But as the video kept playing, he heard a retching sound coming from the computer's speakers. He turned to look back at his earlier self, filmed only the night before. Except what he was seeing play out on screen now wasn't what he remembered happening last night. It couldn't have, because the Holden in that video was choking. That wasn't possible. He was alive and watching his own video right now, but somehow the footage was shown him dying, his airway blocked, face turning red, then blue as tears streamed down his cheeks. In the video, Hellholder 98 fell down, dead from asphyxiation, and watching it made Holden feel sick. To make matters worse, none of the comments under the video seemed to have witnessed the same ending. Holden even texts Goth to ask if the same thing had happened, but he described the ending exactly as Holden remembered filming it. But afterwards, it didn't stop happening. 
Everything he watched ended the same. Every clip online, every TV show, every movie. Holden couldn't even read a book without some characters, fictional or otherwise, keeling over and choking to death, just like the characters on the tape. He barely had time to acknowledge the hits his reaction to the deathly videotape were getting. He was too busy trying to figure out why he couldn't stop seeing people dying the exact same way, even himself when he watched back his old Hellholder 98 videos. Reacting to the deathly videotape garnered a respectable 3 million views, but Hellholder 98 never uploaded again afterwards. His channel went silent, remembered only as a one-hit wonder, until the video and the entire channel were taken down. Holden was never reported missing. The Foundation made sure of that when they came by to collect SCP-583 and place the videotape into containment. Now, if you're still in the mood for some lost media that you might not want to watch alone, then you should go and check out SCP-1733 Season Opener. Or if you like your TV game shows to be a little too real and a lot deadlier, why not grab the remote and hit play on SCP-024, The Announcer.